Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you in webinar number 29, which is an educational symposium organized by the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. This webinar is one of the webinars organized by the Egyptian Society of Neurological Surgeons and the Continental Association of African Neurosurgical Societies. This webinar in particular will be three sessions. Each session is one hour. I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all our distinguished speakers who are contributing to this neurosurgical activity. I will go by the order by which they speak. Professor Yoshiki Endo, Department of Neurosurgery, Yuhuku University from Japan. Professor Mahmoud Khorashi, Department of Neurosurgery, Aga Khan University, Kenya, and the President of the Continental Association of African Neurosurgical Societies as well. Professor Alan Taylor, Chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery, University Cape Town, South Africa. Professor Takuya Akai, Professor of Neurosurgery, University of Toyama, Japan, and the Board Member of the Japanese Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery. Professor Samuel Zimberg, Professor of Neurosurgery, University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Professor Shinichi Yoshimura, Department of Neurosurgery, Hyugo Medical College from Japan. Professor Robert Spitzler, Professor of Neurosurgery and former Chairman of the Barrow and Neurological Institute, Phoenix, Arizona, USA. Professor Satoshi Kuroda, he is chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery, University of Tokoyama, or University of Toyama, Japan, and co-chairman of the Education and Training Committee of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. I would like also to express my sincere appreciation to our distinguished moderators, Professor Lucas Rasolik, Professor of Neurosurgery, University of Belgrade, Serbia, and he's the president of the Serbian Neurosurgical Society and chairman of the Peripheral Nerve Surgery Committee of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. Professor Nelsi Zenon, Professor of Pediatric Neurosurgery at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. She's also chairman of the Pediatric Neurosurgery Committee of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. And she's co-chairman of the Education Committee of the International Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery. Professor Miguel Reyes, he is chairman and professor of neurosurgery at the University of Malaga from Spain and chairman of the WFNS Foundation. Thanks to all of you for contributing to this neurosurgical activity and for giving us much of your time, sharing your knowledge and experience uh, with young neurosurgeons, especially at this difficult time of COVID-19 pandemic is well appreciated. Uh, as second vice president of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, I understand that one of the important missions of our organization is to promote educational activities among all, neuro, among all young neurosurgeons, especially in the developing countries. I'm particularly pleased and humbled by the active role played by the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies in the process of education and training. It's my pleasure to announce the opening of the symposium. Before starting the scientific lectures, I would like to invite Professor Satoshi Kuroda, the chairman of the Education and Training Committee of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, for a welcome note. Uh, good afternoon or uh, good morning, good evening. Uh, this time, uh, uh, I'm very pleased and uh, very proud uh, to collaborate with uh, uh, Professor Nasa El Gandu to organize an uh, African and Asian collaboration education symposium uh, today. Uh, it, it would be a, a great contribution uh, 
uh, for us uh, to educate uh, uh, many young neurosurgeons uh, over the world, including uh, Africa. So uh, uh, I was uh, very uh, looking forward to uh, for uh, joining uh, this uh, symposium uh, today. Uh, we will uh, enjoy a, a lot uh, to uh, listen to uh, many, many uh, excellent uh, lectures, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kuroda. May we take the privilege uh, of the presence of Professor Mahmoud Khorashi among the speakers, and I invite him for a welcome note as president of the Continental Association of African Neurosurgical Societies. Mm -hmm. Mahmoud, are you here? Okay. Now I invite Professor uh, Lucas uh, 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 Rasolik. He is the moderator of the first session to start the first session about spine. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, once again, uh, from Belgrade, from Serbia, good morning or good evening uh, from wherever uh, young neurosurgeons and all other distinguished colleagues are following us uh, in these outstanding uh, activities, uh, educational activities and um, uh, continuous initiative uh, of educational initiative of World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. Uh, now I'd like to express once again my gratitude uh, for giving me the opportunity to moderate this uh, always uh, fascinating and challenging session about um, uh, spinal cord. Um, and uh, we'd like to congratulate to Professor Nasser El Gandur and Professor Satoshi Kuroda for their uh, outstanding efforts uh, in organization of uh, this, uh, this meeting. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be uh, and privilege now to be a moderator of this uh, session. And uh, now in order not to waste time, I would like to invite uh, our first speaker, in uh, session number one of this uh, 29 uh, webinar of Africa and Asian Collaboration Education Symposium of uh, WFNS, uh, with particular name of the topic spinal cord uh, tumors and AVMs, uh, and uh, Professor Toshiki Endo from Japan will give us uh, this lecture. Professor Endo, please continue. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and a great opportunity for me to present in this great uh, meeting. Um, thank you very much to all. If I could uh, rephrase my talk, uh, I would like to discuss about uh, fluorescence guidance uh, for the surgery, especially for the spinal cord intramedullary tumors and AVMs. Uh, there's no COI to be clear. I am from a Tohoku University in Sendai, which is Northern part of Japan. And actually founder of our university department is a professor Jiro Suzuki, who is a, a who named the Moya Moya disease in 1960s. I personally had a experience in the Mayo Clinic as a clinical fellow uh, for three years with uh, Dr. Peepras. And also I had a experience as a research uh, fellowship in Karinska Institute with Lars Olsen, which gave us actually a chance to pursue the spinal cord surgery and spinal cord injury research. So if I want to uh, speak about the spinal cord surgery, uh, including tumors and AVMs, uh, main purpose for the spinal cord uh, tumor uh, surgery is uh, maximum resections and complete obliterations of the AVMs as well as, which is probably most important, is the functional preservations. So here, I would like to discuss how we can achieve uh, the goal by using the fluorescence, especially uh, we focus here on the endocyanine green. And I would like to show some cases about the spinal cord, AVM, hemangioblastoma, and cavernous angiomas. As we all know, uh, Anatomy is important. So this is the arterial system of the spinal cord. 
depending on where the shunt or ABM locates, we can classify perimeter of fistula, intramedullary, dural, or epidural. Sorry, my slide sometimes doesn't come off very well. However, if I continue uh, with a case that this is a typical case of the dural AV fistula at the cranial surgical junction. This is a 68 year old male who had a bilateral leg weakness, hypesthesia, difficulty voiding. And we can see hyperintensity from the medulla to the spinal cord cervical, as well as the flow void on the ventral side of the spinal cord. And assuming that this is the AVM or AV fistula, we proceeded to the angiography. So this is the angiography right vertebral artery, which shows the fistulas point as well as the drainer reflex to the interdural. Then we can safely diagnose this case as a dural every fistula. So this is a fistulas point, and we usually use the surgical simulations. This is a combined image of the uh, CT scan and the angiogram, which actually tells us that if we perform the C1 hemilaminectomy, we can locate the origin of the drainers, which is the point where we uh, operate. So this is a surgical video. I hope uh, it can be, uh, it can show to you uh, the, the surgery itself. And this actually, we uh, had a template clip uh, on the origin of the drainer. Then we had uh, performed the ICG video angiography. Uh, this is a vertebral artery and a lateral spinal artery and a spinal cord. Actually, this is a cranial side. And if we remove the temporal clip, which can suddenly show the drainers, which means this is the origin where we should obliterate. So in the surgery, based on the guidance of the intersigning brain, we cut the drainers and we safely manage the venous conditions which the patient had suffered. By doing so, we can make the patient remarkable improvement neurologically, as well as improvement in MRI image, as I show in the right side. So this is another case uh, which had a 76 year old male who had a hem uh, subacrine hemorrhage. Actually, this is the epidural AV fistula at the cranial cervical junctions. And the problem was the, the patient had anterior spinal artery aneurysms. So this is the MRI. You can see the aneurysms which bled on the ventral side of the spinal cord at cranial cervical junction. So the question is how we can manage this. So this is the angiogram. If we try to do the endovascular surgery, people can think about the catheter through the anterior spinal artery and obliterate here which is actually a little bit difficult because there's no safety margin. So we performed the direct surgery from the back. And to, uh, to approach the ventral side of the spinal cord from the back and the dorsal hemilaminectomy opening, we have managed to use the angled endoscope to see the ventral side of the spinal cord. Nowadays, in the last few years, the endoscope has evolved to get the endosigning green facility. So we can use the endocyanin green endoscope in this case. So this is a video that I published in the uh, Journal, Journal of Neurospine, Journal Spine last year with uh, my friend Mansour from the Egypt, Ahmed. And this is the ventral side of the spinal cord, anterior spinal artery and aneurysms which bled. So this is actually the ICG, which I can show you a little bit better and later in the video. And this is the aneurysm which bled, and there was a pulsating from the, the base of the aneurysm, which is here. So this is the part which bled. Eventually, uh, I put the aneurysm clip, and the question is if we can obliterate aneurysms as well as preserve the anterior spinal artery. The ICG video angiography endoscopy showed us that good preservation of the anterior spinal artery with obliteration of the aneurysms which was really difficult to see this view by the uh, microscope, unless we tell the spinal cord uh, really, really uh, in higher degree. Eventually, uh, we could place a clip and preserve the anterior spinal artery here. I hope you can appreciate this. 
and the patient has been doing fine after the surgery. So in the second part, I would like to focus more on the uh, vascular tumors uh, using the how, how we use the ICG. Of course, the, there's a, some papers showing the ICG video angiography is uh, useful to, to see the surface of the spinal cord and the vascular anatomy, especially for the hemangioblastoma. So this is our original case that we performed the surgery on the, the dorsal spinal cord, hemangioblastoma. By using the ICG video angiography, we can locate the feeders among the many vessels, which is otherwise difficult to appreciate. So by detecting the tumors and feeders, we can cut the feeders first, and we can try to remove the tumors. We use the SCP and MEP in all the cases and try to secure the functional preservation as well as the legionectomy. So after the tumor removal, we can see the ICG again to make sure that we preserve the vessels on the spinal cord. And this is another example. Actually, this is the, we uh, published uh, in several years ago using the fluorescent guided resections for the cavernous angiomas. As we all know, cavernous angioma is the angiography occult lesion, so which has a MRI contrast enhancement, sometimes heterogeneous and sometimes there's no enhancement. But interestingly, if you perform the ICG for these such cases, there's a, almost a flow void which shows the demarcation of the lesions. Of course, we can see a little bit uh, guess the lesion here. However, the ICG angiography is uh, useful. I would like to show this in a recent case, which is a 46 year old female patient who had uh, several bleeding from the this uh, C12 dorsal spinal cord cavern angiomas. This is on the cranial side and the quarter side, midline C1 laminectomy. And we open the dura, then we can see the dorsal surface of the spinal cord. To enter this case, actually, we, I would like to uh, go through the midline approach. So this is the ICG. As you can see, this is a flow, almost a flow void. And this is the surface of the spinal cord. And you the ICG, if you could bear the repeat of the videos. Uh, so this is a slow flow, spinal cord perfusion, and covenant malformation. Of course, the ultrasound is useful, which we sometimes use it. And we can see the margin of the tumors. And we can safely feel that we can approach here or there. In this case, uh, we cut the midline and we went into the dorsal spinal uh, midline approach. Then we can encounter the tumors and there's some bleeding. And this is a posterior column, which I would like to secure and preserve. So we use the fine needles to see the sharp dissections between the lesion and the tumors. And the, this is a small lesions. However, the, we try to locate uh, the margin between the tumors and the normal spinal cord. Actually, uh, this is a midline approach and we were not able to remove all the tumors unless we had a, a push the posterior spinal column in higher degree. So I tried to remove these tumors from this portion, dorsal root entry zone. I cut it out and try to sneak inside of the spinal cord from another hole and try to make uh, the connection of the holes. By doing so, I was able to remove all the tumors from the two entries, which is both safe. So we could, I could utilize the by, you know, dual spinal cord uh, incisions. And however, the patient has been doing fine after the surgery and she was happy after the surgery. So this is the final view that I was able to remove the tumors and we were able to preserve the vessels. And actually the spinal cord SCP and MEP has been preserved. Patient has been uh, uh, you know, uh, doing fine, no disability and she was doing fine. 
So like I said, I summarized the entry zone to the spinal cord, which mostly in case, for example, ependymoma, which had a midline central canal oriented region, we use the posterior median sarcus approach. So some cases we have a cavernous angioma here. In those cases, we have a dorsal root entry zone approach. So uh, we have a variety of the way that we could go inside of the spinal cord and preserve the functions and try to remove the tumors. So actually, this is a final slide, the summary for us to guide with the spinal cord surgery. I was not able to touch the 5-ALA amino leveling acid, which I contributed a chapter to this book about how we use the spinal cord the tumors. By the way, ICG was useful to determine, demonstrate the vascular structures in AVM and the vascular surgeries, vascular tumors, and carbonoma negative fluorescence also helpful. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, uh, Toshiki Endo, for this uh, excellent presentation and uh, very, very high tech uh, and uh, very powerful and uh, I hope we have a, a discussion in time when it is estimated for discussion. So I would like now to invite uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Mahmoud Qureshi from Kenya, uh, President of Continental Association of uh, African uh, Neurosurgical Societies, uh, to give us a lecture about improving outcome in spinal tumors surgery. Thank you very much. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yeah, yes. Thank you. Uh, that was a, a brilliant overview of how surgery should be done. Thank you very much, uh, Toshiki. That was uh, uh, absolutely fascinating stuff. Uh, and uh, my role is much more simpler. <laughs> I do not have very high technical photo, uh, videos for us. Uh, the focus is on uh, residents and young neurosurgeons and uh, given, essentially give some uh, key messages on how does one improve outcomes in the kind of surgery that Toshiki has just shown us. And once again, I'd like to thank Professor Gandur, who is uh, not only a very close colleague and a friend, but has been instrumental in promoting uh, neurosurgical training standards across uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And for him to have organized such a high powered uh, group of uh, speakers from uh, through the African Asian collaboration and even across uh, the Atlantic to USA uh, and further to invite uh, somebody like myself to give my humble view is really uh, very gratifying. And I'd like to thank you very much, uh, Professor Nasser. Uh, I would like to also uh, acknowledge the presence of you know, uh, someone I, uh, I regard as a close friend and a very uh, close colleague, Professor Alan Taylor from uh, uh, Cape Town. So essentially, how does one go about trying to improve outcomes in spinal tumor surgery? Uh, primarily, you first have to focus on your uh, pre-operative evaluation. We have a lot of uh, young neurosurgeons who are now trained in uh, looking at MRIs and the decision to operate uh, is based purely on imaging. Uh, we, I strongly recommend that we go back to the days when one does a very thorough clinical examination and a neurological examination. The reason for that is there will be subtle changes. And even if the patient comes out of surgery well following uh, the procedure, they may have some subtle changes uh, which they will tell you about. And if you haven't documented them, then uh, you're at a loss. Uh, the, patient, uh, the clinicians are at a loss as to whether this was present preoperatively or not. The scan might show a brilliant excision of the tumor, but the patient is complaining about uh, dysesthesia, uh, uh, impairment of uh, 
uh, sensation or sensory or motor function. And if you haven't adequately documented that prior, you don't know whether this was present before or not. So I'm not just saying that this is a good practice from a medical legal point of view, it is good practice from a clinical point of view. So always try to have a good a multidisciplinary team evaluation. And key amongst them is of course, uh, the neurosurgeon that's oneself, uh, who must know how to do a very good neurological examination. We tend to sort of uh, abrogate this to our neurology colleagues. One must examine the patient. And then have a good thorough discussion with your neuroradiologist. We have this tendency to suggest to ourselves that we look at our scans ourselves and I, we understand our scans, but neuroradiology is expanding and developing at a very fast rate. And there may be certain uh, uh, applications that your neuroradiology colleague will look at it uh, in more detail and determine for you uh, the exact uh, type of tumor, its extent, uh, Preoperative MRI evaluation is, uh, and a discussion in detail is very valuable. Uh, and it assists not only in delineating the position of the tumor, but you also can then identify associated cysts as syrinxes within or near the tumor and see whether this tumor has had a hemorrhage. All these things are absolutely vital to uh, document uh, before one embarks on a sensitive structure, uh, which can be quite unforgiving uh, if one is not being very careful. That's the spinal cord. The spinal canal, uh, this is a, a patient who presented with uh, progressive neoplasia uh, with paraparesis. Uh, this patient incidentally also had an L5-S1 lesion um, and uh, primarily because he was getting uh, weak on uh, the left side, he uh, uh, on, 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 on getting paraparetic uh, was diagnosed initially to have a lumbar disc uh, discectomy. And only when uh, further evaluation was done, again, the patient may present with features of a radiculopathy in the L5S1 region. You do an MRI, you look at the disc and you say, oh, that's where the problem is. But if you're thorough in your evaluation, you will realize that the patient's problem is not that uh, lesion of the L5S1, which was not convincing. And then you look up and then you see something higher up. This was the situation in this particular patient. Uh, so the key, of course, is a, a good microsurgical technique, very brilliantly uh, illustrated by uh, the talk that's just ended. Uh, essentially, you want to adequately expose your dura. It is, you cannot afford to have a very small incision and trying to uh, uh, trying to press on uh, you know pull on structures, and that can really lead to a disaster. So, adequately expose the dura uh, so that you can ensure a tension-free decompression of the tube. You. Uh, are advised if uh, you have it, and most centers would now have it, uh, to learn how to use the ultrasound yourself. Uh, it may sometimes be a bit tedious for the radiographer or the radiologist to come in to do that for you. If you can learn how to use your intraoperative ultrasound, then by all means learn it, because in particularly this type of surgery, you'll find it very valuable. So intraoperative ultrasound assists in defining the rostrocaudal extent of the tumor. Once you have exposed, once you have done the appropriate uh, laminectomy, you have exposed your dura satisfactorily. Uh, the, uh, you then obviously very meticulously under microsurgery, a surgical view, open the, the, uh, the dura. The approaches that again have been demonstrated by the first talk, uh, the dorsal median sulcus is usually uh, where one wants to go through. And it is identified by following the course of the penetrating vessels arising from the midline dorsal medullary vein. 
once you've identified the dorsal medullary vein and you've seen the vessel penetrating uh, from it, you will be able to identify, even if it is distorted by the tumor, uh, the medial sulcus. The myelotomy is then centered over this sulcus. In laterally placed tumors, as was shown in the uh, uh, first uh, video of uh, uh, first lecture, the entry zone employed could be through the dorsal root entry zone. And as was shown very uh, ad, uh, eloquently, you could use both uh, the uh, medium uh, sulcus as well as the dorsal root uh, to get to the tumor. Uh, fine microsurgical tools are absolutely essential. Uh, you cannot go through this without being very meticulous uh, in developing a plane around the tumor that you hopefully have identified um, through ultrasound. And the cord, as we said, is unforgiving. If you're not gentle with handling the cord, uh, you can get. So to improve your outcomes, learn your microsurgical technique as, a, as an art. Uh, this is not something you want to rush through. Tumor debulking. Uh, we tend to use, because we do not uh, at our place have an ultrasonic aspirator or a tumor desiccator, we tend to use uh, piecemeal uh, removal. Uh, we can debulk this tumor. If you've adequately exposed it, then you debulk it very carefully, achieving this through pottery and excision. Again, very gentle microsurgical excision. This helps to debulk the tumor with minimal retraction on the spinal cord during resection, making the process less traumatic to the um, cord parenchyma. As we said, an ultrasonic aspirator would be very helpful uh, if you have one. Some authors have discouraged, and I'd like to hear the views of others who operate on uh, these tumors more regularly, uh, discouraged the use of pile retraction sutures, uh, suggesting that that retraction alone uh, of the dorsal columns increases the incidence and severity of dorsal column dysfunction. And if you think about it, that does make sense because uh, in a tight cord which has been pressed by tumor, it's already compromised its uh, uh, circulation. You, you retract the dorsal columns further using retract, pale retraction sutures, you may compromise it further. Uh, and even if you achieve a very good excision, you might uh, end up with a poor outcome. So whilst some advise peel closure, and again, I'd like to hear the thoughts of others who do this more uh, very regularly, uh, you know, some advise peel closure following tumor resection, but this is currently considered a risk factor in promoting the development of a post-operative syrinx. If you want to leave that open uh, to the, sub uh, the, the subdural space, uh, you're less likely to develop a progressive uh, syrinx. And that's the uh, approach that was shown in the first video. Essentially, you want to approach it through uh, the midline, get to the tumor, debulk it uh, and achieve what you want to achieve. But uh, this was a, an ependymoma, uh, which was uh, removed in one of our patients. Again, some where total uh, agreement is lacking, but the use of high dose intravenous uh, methyl uh, has been advocated. Uh, according to the guidelines for the management of acute cervical spine and spinal cord injury from the AANS uh, and the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, this is uh, not of value for treatment of acute spinal cord injury uh, because it is not recommended with level one evidence. However, uh, there are those who, uh, from, who have shown from electrophysiological evidence that perioperative administration of a high dose intravenous methyl immediately after the detection of any significant reduction in the uh, muscular uh, evoked potentials and their amplitudes may improve neural conduction during spinal cord surgery. And I'd like to hear what others in this uh, distinguished uh, panel have to think of, uh, have to say about it. The authors, uh, Dagon Jun, uh, in Journal of Interoperative Neurophysiology, for example, 
have strongly recommended that one administer a high dose of intravenous methylprednisolone over 15 minutes, followed by a maintenance dose. Uh, and they tend to do that if there is any significant reduction of the MEPs during surgery. Uh, I think this really is the workhorse for safe uh, outcomes in, uh, in spinal cord surgery. One has to, uh, in this day and age, operate uh, not just with a microscope and a cavitron and ultrasound, but with very uh, detailed intraoperative monitoring. For this, you really want to have someone uh, with you, either a neurologist with uh, a keen interest or a very, very good technologist uh, who understands uh, the neuromonitoring uh, parameters. In spinal cord tumor surgery, muscle motor evoked potentials, that's the MEPs, the direct wave, that's the D wave, have been used to predict neurological outcomes and one must religiously for, look, at, look out for these. As any deterioration, uh, particularly any severe deterioration of uh, muscular MEPs in the presence of an intact D wave may indicate a temporary post-operative weakness. Uh, but the we, uh, absence of the D wave uh, should be looked for very, very closely. And this is the kind of imaging you get. There are good uh, 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 applications that are brought in on a laptop inside the operating room by the neurophysiologist or the neurophysiology technician. So intraoperative neuromonitoring is valuable in predicting the likelihood of post-operative neurological deficits. The D-wave, the SSEPs, uh, the muscular uh, MEPs have a high sensitivity and specificity to predict post-operative deficit. Sensitivity of up to 85%, specificity of up to 97% have been reported by uh, um, uh, colleagues, including uh, uh, Franco Savadei, uh, president of the WFNS in his paper uh, in the Journal of Neurosurgery Spine. Patients who are older than 65 and those who have anterolateral, intradural, extramedullary tumors are most uh, likely to benefit from intraoperative neuromonitoring. If it's an uh, extradural, uh, intradural, extramedullary tumor uh, that is lying in the posterior, um, parts of the cord, that may be different, but anything anterolateral, I think one, or certainly anything that is inside the cord parenchyma really must not be operated without a good intraoperative neuromonitoring. Well, uh, using the word must not be is a bit too strong, but it's recommended that one doesn't. Is there a role for hypothermia? I think the jury is out really. Uh, there are those that uh, suggests that intraoperative moderate hypothermia of bringing the temperature down below 33 degrees during spinal tumor resection uh, has been shown to be possible and safe. Uh, this was in the uh, general therapeutic hypothermia and temperature management. Uh, but they concluded uh, that further studies really are necessary to determine its role as an effective neuroprotection strategy. And uh, when you think about it, it does make sense, but uh, I don't think there is any uh, evidence, uh, certainly no uh, class one or class two evidence to suggest that it does. And again, I'd like to hear what my colleagues who operate on these uh, regularly feel about the role of hypothermia, whether you want to uh, give it through uh, catheters that are placed uh, intravascularly, or do you want to uh, douse the wound with uh, a cold saline to bring down that temperature? I'd be keen to hear what others feel, but certainly this has been suggested as a possible uh, neuroprotection strategy. Finally, once you've had the tumor out, you've hopefully had uh, a good uh, excision and you one has not disrupted the intraoperative uh, neuromonitoring parameters sufficiently. It, it is 
Uh, the, the insurance companies love us for discharging our patients very quickly on day one or day two. Uh, we would uh, suggest that rehabilitation postoperatively has positive effects on recovery and outcomes of patients uh, with spinal tumors. And it's been shown that rehabilitation uh, commenced as soon as patient is stable following surgery. That's two to seven days, significantly improves overall outcomes. And patients with benign tumors seem to uh, uh, improve uh, most from early rehabilitation. So do take your time and work with your neuro rehabilitation specialist. Uh, and uh, patients with malignant tumors also show overall improvement in their function, their mood, their quality of life, and survival following a dedicated neuro rehabilitation program. So this is something to be encouraged. So this is an overview. The key messages uh, of this talk are have a good neurological examination done by yourself, a good preoperative evaluation, meticulous intraoperative microsurgical technique, use of intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring. Let's keep the question of hypothermia in mind and look out for any uh, uh, work or research that's coming out by people who do this uh, work and use of adjunct tools such as intraoperative ultrasound, uh, the ultrasonic aspirator, uh, laser ablation if it is uh, available and safe, and early neural rehabilitation postoperatively. All of these uh, contribute to improve outcomes. With that, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to share some thoughts on, uh, along with distinguished panelists in this uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Qureshi, for this uh, uh, presentation, which is also very uh, useful and uh, uh, very instructional to the all uh, participants, I would say, and I believe that it is so. And uh, now we should continue to our next speaker, uh, Professor Alan Taylor from South Africa uh, with his topic, surgical treatment of spinal AVMs. And then we will have a time for a discussion. Please, Professor Taylor. Lucas, thank you very much. And thank you to Toshiki and Moody for their talks. I'm going to ask Moody just to stop sharing so I can put my screen on. Yes, Professor Kureshi, just uh, uh, stop sharing your screen uh, in order to, to share Professor Taylor's screen. Great, thank you very much. So I'm very happy that the first two speakers have uh, touched on some of the aspects of uh, spinal cord vascular work. And I'm going to present something that's perhaps slightly different. Um, and I'm going to, to start by looking at selecting cases for, for surgery. And I've put up some here that I think are really suitable. So that would be the dural fistulas that Toshiki showed, phylum terminale fistulas. And I'm sorry, my picture seems to have disappeared. And the pediatric cases with hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. So dural fistulas, I think everybody's familiar with, and this is an endoscopic picture where you can see the dural supply converging on the base of this uh, spinal vein. And the vein is arterialized, uh, results in cord congestion. This of course is very nice for surgery and we would probably be operating on the majority of our dural fistulas rather than treating them endovascularly uh, by just disconnecting and putting a clip on that vein. Phylum terminale fistula is very simple as well. It's a matter of just closing the vein. These lesions, the hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia lesions would be slightly more complex. Um, this is an example of a child presenting with cord compression. And you can see that there's a very large venous pouch. This is a right-sided injection of the posterior spinal axis and you can see the rope ladder running across the dorsum of the spinal cord, filling 
the uh, posterior spinal axis on the opposite side entering this big venous pouch. And this is what compresses the spinal cord. If we look on the left side, also filling the posterior spinal axis, a much larger vessel descending. And at this point, there's a common hole. So here and here is the same point. And this would be a very suitable point for surgery just to put a clip across that vessel to treat it. So good examples. That's not what I'm going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about is subpeal parenchymal nidus lesions in the spinal cord. And I, I mean, I, I run a, a vascular practice, but these are not common lesions. So I probably see five or six new patients a year with spinal cord AVMs. And of those, most we would treat endovascularly. It's really the mi minority that would go for surgery. And of course, the treatment risk has to be better than the natural history risk. And as soon as you start operating in the spinal cord on AVMs, there's a risk of causing neurological deficit. So in my practice, it's almost certainly smaller lesions that are quite tightly focused in the cord. It's younger patients, often patients that have presented with a hemorrhage and have a, an existing neurological deficit. These are, if I look at our patients that we've operated on, these are the patient uh, characteristics. Just a little bit about the technique before I show you a video of a, an example of a case. And I'm just going to show one example. I had planned to show two, but in the interest of time, I think it would be fair to, to just show the principles of one. So pre-surgery, I think it's really important to have an MRI and uh, uh, subtracted angiography and to really understand that well before entering into planning surgery. And I'll show you why. In terms of the operation, um, anybody who knows me knows that, that I speak very poorly of hybrid operating rooms. I think they're a waste of uh, money because I think if you're selecting patients correctly, you should be either doing them in a angiography suite or in an operating room. This is the one exception that I make. Uh, I do think it's very useful to have intraoperative spinal angiography while operating on a spinal AVM. It's not necessary to have a hybrid operating room. I don't. So we do this surgery in the angiography room and we just set it up. We bring our operating instruments into the, the angiography room. As Moody said, it's really important to have intraoperative physiology uh, that's being checked all the time. And um, I'll show you what we do with the operating microscope, but your operating microscope needs to have video as well, because you want to record the angiography that I'm going to show you that we do using methylene blue. So let me show you an example of a case so you know what I'm talking about. So this is a young man and he presents with a fairly rapid onset uh, paraparesis and urinary difficulty. And you can see on the T2 image, there's clear flow voids on the dorsum of the spinal cord. And there's what appears to be a nidal lesion. There is some edema extending inferiorly and cranially in the spinal cord. No clear evidence of a hemorrhage. And if we look on the axial image, this lesion is situated in the anterior quadrant of the spinal cord. So not particularly easy to get to surgically. Suitable for surgery because it's a lesion at T10. It's a very tight nidus, young patient. So in his lifetime, he's likely to have further issues, particularly if he's presenting with a neurological deficit already. So we felt this was a good case to look at. So as I said, it's important to get uh, selective angiography and you can see on the right T10 injection, we are filling a segmental vessel that is the posterior spinal artery. And we know that because of this really tight turn at the top, there's a descending posterior spinal that fills what appears to be the origin of the nidus. And you can see here's the nidus filling and there's a large descending vein. 
And again, on a slightly delayed view, you know there's going to be some ascending uh, Venus exits to this as well. So just so we know what we're talking about, uh, this is the typical anatomy. This is a drawing by my teacher, Pierre Lejeunias, and that's one I refer to often. So anterior spinal supply is always going to be on the anterior nerve root, coming up, curving down in a gentle way. And the supply to the nidus and the AVM has to be through the sulcocommissural perforating branches. We know that there's supply from the posterior spinal. So this is coming up on the dorsal roots, hitting the posterior spinal axis. The only way that it can get to this anterior part of the cord is either transparenchymally, let's hope not, or on the circumflex, the coronary branch that's coming around subpeel on the outside of the spinal cord. That's the likely way that the supply is getting to this AVM. On the opposite side, T9, one level uh, higher up, we have the anterior spinal supply. So this is a large anterior spinal artery. It's large up here because it's got some sulcocommissural supply to the AVM nidus and we're filling exactly the same veins. So a little bit about this technique and Toshiki showed you what's possible with uh, intraoperative fluorescence. I'm gonna show you something slightly different. And this was taught to me by Hong Chi Zhang, uh, who works in Beijing and Hong Chi and Ling Feng who work together have probably the greatest experience of operating on spinal cord AVMs. So we asked Hong Chi to come and show us how he does it. And uh, this is how I learned the technique that I'm about to, to show you. So this is our angiography room. And you can see we've brought in an operating microscope. We have a scrub sister with all the instruments. We have uh, tech to do the angiography. And before we start operating, we put in a sheath into the groin. We use an armored flexible sheath that we can bring around to the back where we make the incision so that during the surgery, we can stop and do angiography. It's slightly difficult because it means doing the angiography on an upside down patient, but after a bit of practice, it's, it's not difficult at all. So I apologize, my <laughs> recording software has got some noise there. Here's the spinal cord exposed. And uh, you can see the first step is really just opening the arachnoid. We know that the lesion is anterior, so we've got to expose the lateral side of the cord to try and reach that. And we want to try and identify this posterior spinal supply that's coming to the nidus. So how do we do that? Well, the first step is to do angiography on the lesion. And you can see we've injected the right T10. We're filling from the different side because the patient is upside down now. But we're in the correct vessel and we're filling the nidus. So once we know that, the next step is while we've got the video on on the operating microscope, we're going to inject a very diluted solution of methylene blue into the artery. And that's what it looks like. So you can actually now see that this is the vessel. This is the posterior spinal vessel descending down to reach somewhere over here where there's the nidus. So I'll just play that again. And you can see why it's useful to record this because you have the opportunity to look at it again after having just done a single injection of methylene blue. And again, I apologize if there's any noise. So now we continue the dissection. We know that this is the posterior spinal entry into the nidus. We followed it. This is the nidal entry point. And we can start to coagulate and reduce the inflow into this nidus. And as we do this, as we dissect further in, uh, check the intraoperative monitoring. And of course, we're going to repeat the angiography. And this is the injection of exactly the same vessel the posterior spinal supply to the nidus has now disappeared. So we've managed to remove that and we move on to the next vessel. So we go to T9 on the left, do an injection and the anterior spinal axis, here's the descending anterior spinal, is still filling the nidus through the sulcocommissural supply. 
So again, we keep that exposure, inject methylene blue, and you can see there's a small bit of nidus that's filling early on. And we can continue our resection of the nidus in the cord until eventually we keep checking with angiography. You can see at the end, there's no longer filling of the spinal cord. On this, it looks like the distal anterior spinal is absent. It's not, it just fills a lot slower. It's the same as resecting AVMs in the brain is when you do a post-operative angiogram, the dilated vessels that were there before now fill much slower. And this is the effect that we're seeing on spinal angiography as well. So I have found this to be an extremely useful technique. It's also useful for dural fistulas, by the way, if you're struggling to identify which is the vessel that's entering the, the spinal cord is to use um, methylene blue as a method of looking at that. Thank you very much for your, for your time and thank you very much for the invitation to speak. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Teller, for this uh, excellent presentation. Uh, you raise a very interesting uh, point for discussion about the hybrid, about the hybrid rooms. But uh, I don't know how many time we have for discussion. I would like to thank all speakers for uh, keep, skipping uh, the time. And, uh, and uh, so far, we have uh, two questions in the question and answer uh, chat and uh, several questions in, in, uh, in uh, uh, general chat. So if we have uh, Professor Gandul, if we have time for, for some questions. Yes, yes, we, we have time for some questions. Thank you. So the, we go first for, to the question and answer chat. We have a uh, question from Professor Hushan Saberi. Any new medical treatments may be suggested in addition to methylprednisolone? He didn't uh, appoint his question to any speaker. So if anybody would like to, to answer this question or uh, to make some comment. Any new medical treatments may be suggested in addition to methylprednisolone? For cases, with for cases with post-operative possible weakness. Not that I'm aware of, but uh, anyone else has any experience with, uh, with, with any new medication that may be trying? Yeah, that is the question. Uh, the, by the way, this is the one question types two times, I mean in two parts. So we have only this question in this uh, uh, question and answer chat. Anybody would like to comment? As I said, this is uh, Mahmoud Qureshi. I, not that I'm aware of. Uh, Alan uh, or anyone else? Uh, uh, Toshiki, do, are you aware of any uh, research going on in, in, in this area? Uh, no, uh, I, besides I, the I, Toshiki, you go. Ahead. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor Taylor. Um, in Japan, we usually don't use the, you know, no more use the steroid metroplazone for the spinal cord injury, and uh, we have many research going on, including the regenerated medicine and the protective, and. Uh, we still don't have any good one answers, but the many research going on in Japan and all over the world, but that's the only comment that I can make right now. Thank you. So we have a next question in uh, general chat from uh, Ahmed Bandari. How we can do hypothermia? The, the technique that was being described is to uh, place a intra arterial catheter uh, and try to give your cold cell line intra intravascularly. But uh, this, this technique was described by the, uh, by the authors of that particular paper that I mentioned. Uh, but I have, as I said, I was uh, hoping that somebody else uses the technique and would be able to guide us on that. Anyone else? Uh, 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 Toshiki or anyone been aware of how, uh, apart from just 
uh, dousing the wound with cold saline. Is there any, any other uh, way that one can reduce uh, the temperature to less than 33 degrees? Have as far as I can that? tell, uh, may I have a comment that, uh, you know, of course that the severe trauma patients or spinal cord, uh, well, basically the brain trauma patients, I have seen a patient who have been treated with a hypersomnia, but uh, not that I know of about the spinal cord uh, cases, as far as I know. Uh, when the, uh, one more question, in order to, to, to let's say, um, keep the time, uh, from uh, Dr. Yerke Medetov from National Center for Neurosurgery in Kazakhstan. Uh, for all panelists, uh, what are the indicators of complications after AVM excisions and do you perform endovascular surgery for AVMs for all panelists? Yes, uh, so it's, it's Alan speaking. I, I would say that the majority of spinal AVMs that I see, we treat endovascularly. And the indications for treatment for me would be whatever is the symptom, treating the symptoms that the patient presents with. If they present with a hemorrhage, the, the idea is to do angiography and try and look for a false aneurysm, the rupture point of the AVM that we would target endovascularly. And uh, if the patient is presenting with a progressive neurological deficit because of cord congestion, we would try and reduce the venous hypertension by reducing some of the inflow into the nidus. So those would be the things that we do most of the time for spinal AVMs. In terms of knowing whether you have injury or not, intraoperative monitoring is by far the most useful indicator of whether you're getting spinal cord injury while you're operating. And we check uh, MEPs and somatosensory potentials every 10 minutes. Every time I'm concerned about something, we would check it. And uh, if there's any change, we would, we would wait and see if the potentials return before, before proceeding. Any other comment? Endos May I have a comment that, uh, uh, you know, our practice, uh, I usually, I'm a spine surgeon and I, I also do the brain surgery, but I, you know, I have uh, my uh, collaborators and their colleagues who is very specialized in endovascular surgery. So the most important for the spinal AVM is a diagnosis. So we see the films together and try to see the indication for the surgery versus endovascular. We negotiate, we you know, have a discussion, great discussion together and decide uh, you know, the treatment options. That's how we do. Okay, thank you. And uh, um, uh, my uh, uh, kind request for all panelists, I mean, including Taylor, Alan Taylor, that. Uh, just for a few comments uh, or uh, short comment about hybrid ORs. Since I brought it up, let me start. My, my objection to hybrid ORs is that they're very expensive rooms to build. And most of the time they sit empty because the cases that require hybrid surgery are not that many. So you have a very expensive room that really doesn't get used for its purpose. I think it's much uh, better to have a dedicated angiography room and a dedicated OR room that's each fit for purpose and to select the patients properly. And my personal experience is we get much better use out of that arrangement. Um, but I, I know there's many places that have hybrid theaters. Thank you. Endo, Sensei, would you like to- Thank you very much. Would you like to make us some comment? Hybrid OR, uh, we don't use it, but sometimes uh, I use the uh, intraoperative angiogram as uh, Professor Tyler used, and we use the ICG in the venous or intraarterial, which could be as uh, useful as the methylene blue, I believe. And uh, thank you very much for the great videos. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Professor Qureshi. Would you like to make some comment about this? Not at all. No idea at all. I haven't been involved in any setting where we have used a hybrid uh, theater and certainly don't have it in, uh, in our setting. Oh, uh, I would like to uh, move this uh, session to the end uh, uh, in order to continue with the next session. Uh, we, we, let's say, um, go 10 minutes uh, 
beyond the schedule, but I think uh, this will be composite in a in a in a forthcoming session. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, to our panelists and to Professor Gandur uh, for organization of this meeting and uh, to the WFNS committee for uh, educational committee for this excellent initiative and. Uh, 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 I would like now to give the floor to our next uh, moderator and uh, to our next panelists, uh, Dr. Professor Nancy Zenon and her panelists, her guests. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lucas. Thank May you. I introduce uh, the moderator of next session? It's going to be a pediatric neurosurgery. Professor Nancy Zenon, uh, she's the chairman of the Pediatric Neurosurgery Committee at the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. Thank you, Nasser, uh, for this uh, kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, we congratulations for this well-organized uh, symposium, educational symposium of the World Federation. And our... Uh, First uh, speaker. Yes. Is, oh, sorry. I am on the. Is uh, Shinichi Yoshida, I'm right? No, uh, the uh, Professor uh, Ta Takuya Akai. Uh, please uh, introduce him, please. I was wondering that I was the moderator for the first session. Okay. <laughs> I will okay. see here, don't worry. Please okay. introduce uh, the first speaker and I continue now, sir. Okay, Professor uh, Takuya Akai, Professor yes. of Neurosurgery at University of Toyama from Japan and the board member of the Japanese Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for, for the introduction. Can you see my slides? Perfect. OK, I will Excellent. start my presentation. Uh, today, I will talk about the pediatric arachnologist. Uh, I will talk about general information of arachnologist. Arachnoidosis is a common disease and constitute approximately 1% of all non-traumatic intracranial space of pain region in children. They may occur at any age, but 75%... Uh, Professor, can I please use yes. a slide show? Oh, okay. Slide show, please. Sorry. All right. Better. Okay. Yes, uh, sorry for that. And 75% uh, are found in child, and uh, it is male predominance, the ratio is ratio male to female, uh, three to one. Uh, Arachnoids occur and locate in various areas and induce different symptoms. Uh, this is a case with a serial fissure. Uh, Arachnoids induce a scar deformity, a temporal bossing, and the orbital deformity with uh, enlargement of head circumference. And this is a supraceral and the posterior force, extended the posterior force arachnoidist induced the visual and pituitary dysfunction. Uh, this is a convex arachnoidist with hematoma inside after head trauma. This is the uh, uh, inter interventricular arachnoidist and induce uh, hydrocephalus and elevation of intracranial pressure. A children fissure arachnoidist uh, is uh, most common and followed by posterior fossa, supraceral, quadrigeminal, interhemispheric, and convexity and interventricular in child. The character of pediatric arachnoidist are different from those in adult it grows, especially during infant period. At age over five years, the growth is less common. And the chest uh, sometimes affect brain development and resulted in the retardation and visual dysfunction. 
and the cysts induce scar deformity, such as I showed before, which would not be happened in adult. And also, the patient has uh, at operation risk of risk of subdural hygroma, hygroma and infection. It's more common compared with adult. How about the indication? It remains in, inconsistent, but we think uh, that the patient with symptoms have indication for the operation. Because if we treat rate, uh, children may lose the chance of recover. Patients with high intracranial pressure have indication without debate. How about the procedures? Which should we do? At least penetration shunt or fenestration by microscope or endoscope. Uh, this slide shows the disadvantage of uh, uh, both procedures. CP shunt needs shunt devices with those maintenance. Shunt malfunction induces major trouble due to the elevation of intracranial pressure and we will life threatening sometimes. Over drainage result in sweet ventricle syndrome and subdural hemorrhage. And also the risk of infection due to foreign materials. It's sometimes very complicated. On the other hand, uh, cyst fenestration have a risk of cerebral spinal fluid weak due to thin scalp and the subdural fluid correction due to the penetration of arachnoid, arachnoid. And sometimes it does not work enough. Uh, we have no big run, uh, randomized study compared to these procedures. Some reports said mentioned uh, uh, it's a re recommended fenestration. On the other hand, others mentioned no difference in those re results. The fenestration does not work for the arachnosis with ventricular megary, and those patients need chest ventricular shunt. For the shunt operation, programmable valve is recommended to avoid over drainage. But we prefer to avoid shunt. The shunt is an excellent procedure, but those are foreign materials and induce many troubles such as infection and hemorrhage. The intracranial pressure is controlled by shunt. Indeed, it is not physiological. The shunt is the last choice for us. How should we perform? the fenestration by endoscope or microscope. Some, reco some reports recommended endoscopic fenestration because of rest invasiveness. But it depends on the location of arachnoid and endoscopic skill. Uh, this slide shows our strategy. For the convexity cyst, uh, we use microscope. For cerebral fissure, either microscope or endoscope. I prefer microscope. For the interhemispheric, microscope or endoscope. Supracellular cyst by endoscope. Interventricular cyst by endoscope. For the posterior fossa cyst, microscope or endoscope. Probably we have a debate for that. I will show some cases. Uh, this is a five-year-old boy presented with headache and skull deformity such as right temporal bossing and orbital deformity forward, the arachnoid cyst locate in cerebral tissue. I will show a video. We did a microscopic fenestration uh, with a zigzag skin tissue to make the wound scar inconspicuous. After small craniotomy, we opened the dura and uh, outer membrane of the cyst and we entered into the cyst cavity through the cyst. This is internal carotid artery and IC and MCA. We made fenestration between optic nerve and the internal carotid artery.
I see. And, and also, also, we also opened the request membrane and the lateral side of internal carotid artery and confirmed the basal artery here. And also, we opened the fenestration, the lateral side of southern nerve. Uh, two years after the fenestration shows a shrunk cyst and good expansion of temporal lobe. For the next case, we did the endoscopic fenestration. The patient, this patient complained headache and MRO images show the Sylvian arachnoidist. For this case, uh, we, did, we used the uh, endoscope. This is named the videoscope. This is a flexible scope and give you a clear image like a rigid scope. We entered into the cyst cavity and this is a set of in the cyst. We use a narrow band imaging to make clear the location of small vessels. This is a usual right. And we open the, sept we open the septum by uh, uh, forceps. and enlarge the uh, cyst four with balloon and entered into the next cavity. With balloon and entered into the next cavity. We have to be careful don't lose our location. This is uh, anterior quinoid process and temporal lobe and uh, frontal lobe and internal carotid artery is here. We open the fenestration in the, between the optic nerve and the internal carotid artery. And CT image at one year after the operation shows a shrunk cyst and the temporal lobe with the expansion. The last, the last case, uh, this patient complained with headache and MR shows uh, intraventricle cyst in large ventricle. The cyst located in both lateral ventricles. For this case, we did endoscopic fenestration with uh, Bafo. We advanced the videoscope into the lateral ventricle through the right side and you can see the arachnosis on both sides. This patient lost the septum, so you can see the uh, cyst on, in both lateral ventricles. At first, we, uh, we opened the uh, cyst with a monopolar coagulator. This is a left side cyst. And we entered in the cyst and we confirmed the location of the cyst membrane on the other side. And we opened the uh, cyst membrane on the other side with the monopolar coagulator. If we can sure nothing on, on the, beyond the membrane, we can use this kind of monopolar coagulator. And we entered in the trigon of lateral ventricle. This is the choroid plexus. And after that, we uh, moved on to the cyst on the right side. And I also opened the cyst with monopolar, co monopolar coagulator and uh, make a couple of holes in the cyst and expand it with, with balloon. Uh, this patient uh, had hydrocephalus. We reconstructed a new shunt system at the same time. After the operation, MR image showed a smaller ventricle. Uh, these are key notes for the arachnoidist operation. We have to make channels to normal CSF space, such as basal system or ventricles. 
and it's better to make uh, multiple channels to get smooth CSF movements. Some cysts have multiple cavities. In those cases, we have to make a single cavity by septostomy, and also we have to be careful without losing the location uh, during the procedure. If we can use navigator, it is useful. We have to be careful for CSF beef, especially in infant due to thin skull. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your conference, Dr. Takuya Akai. Excellent. Yes. Probably we have a discussion at the end. We invite okay. now Professor Samuel Zimberg uh, talk about endoscopic treatment of supracellular cyst. And the end, probably the discussion will be very helpful between uh, endoscopic approach and microsurgical approach. Uh, can you share uh, your screen, Professor Zimberg? Yes. From the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Nasser. Thank you, Satoshi. Thank you, Nelsi, for the invitation, the kind invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I'm going to share uh, my slides with you. Um, my, my presentation uh, became probably much easier because uh, before, after uh, Dr. Uh, Akai presentation. But uh, I'd like to discuss you uh, a very specific kind of cyst, of arachnoid cyst, which is the supracellar. This is a very interesting uh, cyst that was formerly compared to a Mickey Mouse. It's pretty clear why. The, the interesting shape we can see in the CTs and, and MRIs that resembles Mickey Mouse. But probably Mickey Mouse is not alone, and I'm, I'd like to, to show you why in some minutes. So I'm going to rely on these four uh, topics. Uh, the first one is about the pathophysiology. Uh, as many of you know, the first description or, or the first theory for the genesis for the supercellars came from uh, uh, Fox and Omefti in the 80s, about 40 years ago, only 40 years ago. They operated uh, a supercellular cyst through a frontal root. And based, based on their observations, they created the theory that the supercellular will be uh, a result of a malformation of the Lilyquist membrane. But not more than 15 years after, it was proved by neuroendoscopy. Here uh, we see the three most important papers published, published in the 90s showing very elegantly many aspects of the supracellular cyst. This one from Belgium, from Jacamer. This, this one from uh, Spain, showing very clearly a slit valve mechanism at the base of the basilar artery. And the same finding from the German group from Henry Schroeder and Michael, Michael Gabb showing very clearly that the, the growing of the cyst was related to a slit valve mechanism on the basilar artery. At this very beginning became a discussion also if what was best for our patients, uh, the ventricular cystostomy alone or the ventricular cystocystosnostomy. And uh, Philippe Deck in 96 showed us the difference between the two techniques and concluded that ventricular VCCs are better than VCs. But uh, recently this year, a systematic review was published showing the same result that VCC allows uh, better and longer uh, uh, good outcomes. Uh, this is the sequence of uh, events based on the Fox and Amfti's theory, showing that at the beginning, uh, any pathological process at the level of the Lilyquist membrane lead to uh, a cyst in the embryonic life. And as it grows due to the slit valve mechanism, it starts to deform the third ventricle to push the mesencephalon 
to the posterior part of the third ventricle, leading to a closure, closure of both foramen of Morose and the uh, aqueduct of Silvius, leading to hydrocephalus. And this is interesting because this kind of cyst has uh, uh, interesting aspect uh, in its dome, like, like you can see a grayish membrane. And when we, we look inside the supracellar cyst, we can see one of the beautiful images we can see, which is the uh, polygon of uh, Willis. Here's also another beautiful view. It's, 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 it's very uh, uh, nice to look around but advise you to take care during this uh, ventricular tourism. When we talk about clinical features, uh, supracellars are really a tricky location because it's not a common location, as you can see in this European study. It uh, represents about 12% of uh, the cysts. But when we talk about complications, it represents about 38%. And uh, uh, we say this because at that time, shunts were also in the, in, in the market for this kind of treatment. And many, many complications came from shunting uh, procedures. The clinical pictures include hydrocephalus, visual disturbances, and endocrinological disturbances. Uh, I already said that hydrocephalus come from two different mechanisms. And we can divide the, the signs and symptoms into four uh, types. Uh, there are symptoms related to hydrocephalic factors as headache, macrocrania, papilledema. Symptoms related to compressive factors as ataxia, spasticity, paraparesis. Symptoms related to hypothalamic uh, compression and optochiasmatic uh, uh, alterations. Here's uh, a prevalence of symptoms. You can see that symptoms related to hydrocephalus are more common. Here's a big series uh, from Japan, about 73 cases, showing uh, the same uh, picture. The different signs and symptoms depending on the age of the patients. And very interesting symptom is the bubble head doll, uh, which was described in the 60s. It's, it's a, a to and fro movement of the head. Sorry for, I don't, I don't know why my, oh yes. It's a to and fro movement of the head. The, the child can stops uh, voluntarily. It stops also during sleep. Uh, two theories uh, try to explain this feature. One is compression, compression of, the, of the thalamus in the ventricles, leading to stimulation of alpha motor neurons of the spinal column, or a learning mechanism trying to release the, the intracranial hypertension, moving the head and also moving the cyst, trying to make the CSF circulate a little bit. But now, we have to talk a little bit about the new classification. In the beginning of this century, this group from Japan, by the first time, uh, defined two different types of supracellar cysts. Here, uh, they show uh, on the uh, left column a normal aspect. In the middle column, they recognize a dilatation of the interpeduncular cistern alone with no hydrocephalus, with few symptoms. And of the left, on the right column, you see the classical supracellar cyst with participation of the diencephalic and the mesencephalic membranes of the liquid. During uh, the last 10 to 15 years, many papers came trying to elucidate the anatomy of the region and to explain the variability of the cysts. This is a, a, a very nice paper trying to show the pontomesencephalic membranes uh, also involved in the pathophysiology of the supracellars. And about four years ago, this uh, very interesting paper came from the, uh, the group of Paris. 
And after an extensive study using ultrasound, they identified three different types. The, the supracellular type one would be the classical with expansion to the third ventricle and compression of the mesencephalon with hydrocephalus. The type two would be the dilatation of the interpeduncular system alone, not associated with hydrocephalus and with few symptoms, sometimes with no necessity of treatment. And type three, supracellular type three, would be the dilatation of the supracellular system uh, associated to lateral expansion of the cyst, resembling sometimes temporal cysts. So this is uh, the three different types we see in this, uh, in this picture, uh, the three types of cysts. And for the practical purposes, we see that uh, supracellular type one would be the classic one, type two, is the oligosymptomatic cyst related to the interpeduncular dilatation alone. And the sac type three would be cysts with the dilatation of both supracellular system and lateral expansion. So if we had before the Mickey Mouse, now we have two other types, maybe they can be MacDuck and Gaston because or of uh, the shapes. And let's see what we can do in terms of treatment for each kind of cyst. This is SAC1. Maybe all of you have experience with this kind of cysts. In this case, a two years old female with macrocranial and arrest development. Oh, my mouse is not here. Oh, yes. We can see here uh, a supracellar protruding to the foramen of Moreau. I strongly recommend you that you use scissors in order to open very quickly the dome of the cyst. The membrane is always very thick. The, 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 the vessels are not a problem over it. So try to open it very fast. And then we can see that beautiful view of, this, of the dilated supracellar uh, region with the polygon of Willis and also the a, a valvular mechanism at the bottom of the, at the basilar artery. Another another hint is to uh, it's not necessary to touch the arachnoid close to the basilar artery. We can open it over the dorsum cella, which is more safe. And here we can also uh, perform a big hole in order to communicate the cyst with the prepontine uh, system. Let's see another very, very briefly, another case, an adult case. So I'm not sure why my mouse is not working here. Okay. Another case, same situation. We see posterior communicating artery, basilar bifurcation, and then we go to the bottom of the, of the cyst, we see pretty clearly that slit valve mechanism injecting CSF to the cyst and we treat in uh, the, the same fashion. So by doing this, we can have results, very nice results. We see a deflection of the cyst, the return of the structures to its place is one case. Another case in a young child with reopening of the, of the aqueduct. And sometimes the cyst simply, simply vanishes like this. It's not common, but uh, of course, in some cases. And it's always nice to follow in the, in the follow-up time the, the modifications of the, membra of the membranes, uh, uh, showing the return of the dome of the cyst to the, to the floor of the third ventricle and showing that they were really related to a Lilyquist membrane malformation. This is a SAC type 2 with only visual symptoms. It was a young uh, girl with headache and visual disturbances, like you can see here. Uh, as, as I said, uh, cases like this has not hydrocephalus, so we decided to use a subfrontal route. 
supraciliar subfrontal uh, root, and uh, we perform defenestration. But I also have a case like this, which, uh, which uh, is also a SAC type, type 2, which is asymptomatic. It was an incidental finding. And I follow this, uh, this boy from 2012. And you can see here the, the follow up. There's no modification and there's no other symptoms. So generally, SAC, SAC type 2 can be followed and sometimes has not to be operated. SAC, SAC type 3 has a lateral expansion, uh, as you can see here, pre and post operatively. See how, how, uh, how big is the shrinkage of the cyst. And here, it's, it's clearly shown how we can uh, misinterpret uh, this kind of cyst, because they resemble, in some aspects, the, 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 the Sylvian cyst. But we have to pay attention to the supracellar system in order to identify a SAC type 3. This was a four months years uh, boy with increased head circumferences in circumference. This is the, the, the pre-op. This is the surgical uh, pictures showing the inspection of the, of the temporal fossa. And then we move the endoscope to the supracellar region where we, we see clearly the, the deliquist membrane, third nerves, dorsum cellae, the pituitary stalk, pituitary gland, and we open it in the same fashion we do a, a third ventriculostomy. We, we open this membrane alone, and that's all. And see, this is the result we can, we can see. And this is a very, this is another case of SAC3. This is a 70 month old uh, boy with macrocrania. And on the, on the right, the four days uh, follow up. See how, how impressive was the return of the structures to its place. And it's also nice to, to measure the cyst. If you do this, you always will see shrinkage of the cyst in almost all cases. And it's very nice to see the learning curve related to this kind of surgery. Uh, it's, we improve by time to time. And at the beginning, we, we, we took about two hours to operate cysts like this, and now it's a job of 10, 12 minutes. In some cases, we can remove shunts in, in, if the patient was shunted before and you have a, a shunt dysfunction, you, you can remove it. And here uh, we see some po post-operative, uh, not complications, but uh, occurrences. We have some cases of fistula, but generally the cases are doing uh, very well. Precautious puberty can, can, can exist even in treated patients. We have to be aware of it. It's very important to orientate patients and parents about it. And uh, to conclude, I'd say that endoscopic uh, ventricular cystocyst diagnostomy became the gold standard for treatment of supracellular arachnoid cysts. It can be used even in shunted patients. But even if you treat the patients, you can also have precautious puberty, even in, in, in treated patients. And, and, but and, it will uh, not work except and, after the webinar, after we put sorry. the emails inside the link. Sorry, the link is correct, but and, it's not uh, going to work I, except I'd after like to finish, we get all the uh, emails. Tell, the that, link uh, is correct, but it is not going to work. Type one is the classical one. Except after endoscopy. we upload, upload the two, channel. There is no ventricular dilation. Emails and of all participants. Of or if symptomatic after the webinar, be treated either by endoscopy after or the webinar. surgery. And after the webinar is finished, has lateral like extension it. and the link is correct. To a lateral approach. It's not going Thank you to for work. attention. Thank you very much, Professor Zimberg. Uh, excellent lectures. We have the privilege to invite now Nasser Elgondor uh, to talk about the endoscopic treatment of middle cranial fossa arachnoidosis. Probably is excellent uh, discussion about the subject. Thank Are you, you ready, Nasser? Yes. You see, sorry, my mouse is not working. I cannot 
uh, stop sharing just a minute. Okay? I can, I'm not sure that I can, I have this possibility. Can uh, you stop sharing Nasser, for me or, or have... the host? I will uh, stop sharing. Uh... Oh, please do it for me, please. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Nelsie, very much. Uh, and uh, I am uh, glad to be part of this uh, educational symposium. Uh, my talk for today will be about endoscopic treatment of uh, middle cranial fossa arachnoid cysts. For the sake of time, I will be specific about this type of arachnoid cysts. They constitute about 50% of all intracranial arachnoid cysts. There was a long, wrong belief for years that it was due to temporal lobe agenesis. This misconception had been corrected later on when it was possible to recognize splitting of the arachnoid membrane. Middle cranial fossa arachnoid cysts are predominant in children. They appear on the left side and they occur mainly in males. Clinical picture is usually headache. Sometimes uh, there is intracranial hypertension in type two or three cysts, as evidenced by the presence of papilledema. Epilepsy is not uncommon in these patients, usually psychomotor. Other symptoms include temporal bulge or bossing, hemiparesis, and developmental delay. Radiology, as we all know, the cyst originates inside the sylvian fissure, then extends into the middle cranial fossa. A better terminology will be middle cranial fossa arachnoid cysts and not sylvian fissure arachnoid cysts. The cyst fluid gives a signal similar to cerebrospinal fluid, hypointense in T1, hyperintense in T2, and the cyst wall is non enhancing. This is galactic classification which we all know, let us proceed quickly in order to focus on the technical aspects about the endoscopic procedure. Why middle cranial fossa arachnoids? It's the most interesting because they are the most common and the most complex and challenging. The indications are still a matter of debate. Surgical procedure still debatable. This is high recurrence rate, up to 30% reported in some studies, and high incidence of post-operative subdural hygroma which is also up to 30% as reported in some studies. The treatment is debatable, but I would like to emphasize that neurosurgeons should be extremely cautious while selecting patients for surgery in order to avoid doing unnecessary operations or neglecting indicated patients. If there are no symptoms, better to do conservative treatment and follow up the patient and I like to operate only if the symptoms are cyst specific. If they are not cyst specific, I'd like to wait and follow up the patient. The surgical treatment, either shunting, cystoperitoneal shunting, craniotomy, we either do excision of the outer cyst wall, what we call it marsupialization or micro surgical fenestration with the basal cistern, that's for classic teaching. Endoscopy, the procedure is cysto cisternostomy and uh, the endoscopic assisted uh, microsurgery. Endoscopic approach, three different uh, entry points or three different approaches. The transtemporal approach through arterial per hole, just above the zygomatic arch as seen in this diagram. And this is the approach I'm using in all my patients. Transcoronal approach through a pre-coronal bear hole five centimeter from the midline and the superior approach where the trajectory is along the orbital roof. What about the cystocernostomy procedure? I do perianal bear hole. The trajectory is a straight line between the entry point passing through the cyst 
to the prepontine cistern. This is the lens I'm using, rigid two millimeter diameter lens, straightforward to zero degree, wide angle with angled eyepiece and three millimeter working channel through which the instruments are introduced. Identification of the anatomical landmarks is very important. Fenestration is either done between the optic nerve and internal carotid artery, or between the internal carotid artery and the oculomotor nerve, or under the oculomotor nerve, depending on uh, the enough rooming available for the endoscope in order to make the fenestration procedure safely. External ventricular drainage left only if there is intraoperative hemorrhage. Let us go to this publication and have this quotation, the procedure of endoscopic cystoperceptionostomy in the management of this type of cyst is intimidating and potentially dangerous because you are creating an opening I mean important neurovascular structures with limited space available and with reliance on single endoscopic instrument. Let me show you this video for one of my patients. Left sided middle canine fossa arachnoid cyst. You can see a beautiful anatomical picture. The membrane is very transparent up to the extent that uh, my assistant uh, was doubting there is a membrane. But we can see this anatomical picture through the transparent membrane. This is the optic uh, nerve, uh, carot internal carotid artery, kilomotor nerve. As you can see, this angle is very narrow. I don't like to go in the optical carotid angle in this patient. I do fenestration by blood fenestration by using the tip of Fogarty catheter. I go in this patient under the oculomotor nerve. The fenestration already performed under the oculomotor nerve. The fenestration is successful as evidenced by the good flow of cerebrospinal fluid. And uh, we are able to see the basilar artery clearly at the end of the procedure. Another uh, patient, uh, oh, the, the intraoperative uh, photos of uh, this patient uh, were chosen as cover image of the Journal of Neurosurgery. This is video of uh, one of patients included in our series, also left-sided middle cranial fossa arachnoid cyst. You can notice the both optic nerves and optic chiasm, these optic nerves, internal carotid artery, Again, we do the fenestration below the oculomotor nerve. As you can notice here, the cyst is complex, multiple layers. All layers should be opened to ensure that the fenestration is successful. Good flow of cerebrospinal fluid. We are able also to see the basilar artery inside the, the prepontine cistern. Another video for another patient also on the left side. This is a rare video because it is a recurrent case. Little is known about recurrent middle cranial fossa arachnoidosis in the literature. As we can see, both optic nerves and uh, we will be able now to see the internal carotid artery. This is the internal carotid artery.
now I will show you the old fenestration, which is now closed. This is the old fenestration. We go by Fogarty in the same fenestration and reopen the fenestration again. Then we will be able to see the basilar artery, its branches, adequate uh, successful fenestration. But you can see that the membrane or the cyst wall is uh, redundant, uh, and that's not a good sign because it can accelerate uh, post-operative reclosure. This is a basilar artery, all branches, perforators, but you have to be very careful in order not to make any injury to any of these uh, perforators. Restoration is successful. Intraoperative findings, uh, membranes transparent or opaque, it depends on how lucky you are. Anatomical landmark should be identified very clear membrane single layer or multiple layer. You have to report all this, membrane easily fenestrated or tough, fenestration single or multiple, blunt or sharp or both. Site of fenestration, either in the optical carotid angle as Professor Akayo was showing us in the video or in another locations, successful and adequate communication if the basilar artery is seen clearly and there is adequate flow of cerebrospinal fluid and if there is intraoperative bleeding. We published our results in the Journal of Neurosurgery. This shows our results, uh, improvement post-operative radiologically. It is 71.9%. Uh, when we review the literature, uh, a very important uh, extensive study extending over 25 years, just published a few weeks ago, and it is from Germany and uh, it is multi-centric study, study in four centers, including 87 patients. 31 of these patients were temporobasal arachnoids, and the authors went to the conclusion that pure endoscopy is uh, properly in most types of intracranial arachnoid cysts, uh, except the temporobasal arachnoid cysts, because they are the most difficult to treat, and the authors recommend microsurgery or endoscopic assisted microsurgery and not pure endoscopy. This conclusion was based on failure of endoscopy in 12.9% in their patients, either due to intraoperative bleeding or inability to identify the anatomical landmarks. And it was based on high incidence of morbidity, 32.3%, and high incidence of recurrence, 19.4%, among a short time follow-up, which, which was 32.9% month. Advocates for microsurgery believe that bleeding could be controlled easier because uh, microsurgery allows you to use to use both hands and there will be simultaneous use of bipolar and instruments. It allows excision of the outer cyst wall and it avoids subdural effusion. However, I recommend a pure endoscopic procedure in the treatment of middle cranial fossa arachnoid cysts based on the results published uh, in our series. This shows the results, which is matching with another publication published in the child nervous system. In both studies, the pure endoscopic procedure was successful in 100% of the patients. Clinical improvement was ranging from 87% to 92%. Post-operative radiological improvement ranging from 71% to 75%. And the recurrence uh, was uh, 9.4, uh, ranging from 7 to 9%. Uh, the study of Jury was short term. Our study was long term, extending for 55 months. Then I published uh, this conclusion again in a commentary about uh, this recent publication from Germany. I recommend pure endoscopic surgery in the treatment of middle cranial fossa arachnoid cysts. 
let me show you, this is one of uh, my patients. Uh, the left side is a preoperative uh, magnetic resonance imaging axial view. The right side is post-operative image six months after endoscopic uh, cyst to cystonostomy. And you can notice the significant decrease in the cyst size and the expansion of the temporal lobe, which is not usual. You, 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 it's difficult to sometimes to see this image post-operatively in these patients. And I'd like to stress about important point, uh, look at the arrows on the left image, an important prerequisite for endoscopic procedure to be successful is the presence of an area of contiguity between the basal cyst wall and the prepontine cistern without any cerebral mantle. Let us uh, go through some questions. Why the procedure of risky? Because simply because you are creating an opening in the cyst floor. I mean, important neurovascular structures, limited space available, and uh, reliance on single endoscopic instrument. Another question, is neuronavigation essential? No evidence that it increases the safety of the procedure. It can help you to choose the proper trajectory, but it cannot help you to choose the proper target point for fenestration. I believe that its use is dispensable, and uh, neurosurgeons who are familiar to deal with such kind of lesions could easily identify the anatomical landmarks and could easily localize the proper fenestration target point. Also, we have the problem of intraoperative brain shift and errors of measurements, which can occur due to significant cerebrospinal fluid loss in high pressure cysts. But neuronavigation is very important in other types of arachnoid cysts. This is one of my publications about the endoscopic treatment of intraparenchymal arachnoid cysts in children. In such type of lesions, uh, you are unable to identify any anatomical landmarks. And so neuronavigation is very important while operating in these patients. Why sometimes there is no post-operative radiological improvement? Nobody knows, but it may be related to the duration of symptoms and time of operation. Long-standing brain compression will decrease possibility of post-operative brain expansion. Maybe it depends on compliance of the cyst wall. Sometimes the cyst wall is rigid, and so cyst collapse does not occur post-operatively. Mm -hmm. Another important question is how to avoid the subdural effusion. As I said before, that the incidence is high, and it's up to 30% in some publications. In our publication, it was 6.3% after using pure endoscopic procedure. My recommendation to increase, to decrease the incidence of post-operative effusion is to do a very small dural opening, exactly the same size like the diameter of the operating sheath. Please avoid the release of cerebrospinal fluid and uh, avoid cyst collapse, and this will prevent opening of the subdural space. I don't advise direct cyst puncture, which leads to entrance of cyst fluid in the subdural space and try not to detach the outer cyst membrane. How to avoid bleeding, another important question. Important observation in our study, all three patients who had intraoperative bleeding developed postoperative reclosure and recurrence. And so I'm not so much optimistic when there is intraoperative bleeding. How to avoid, you have to do your best to avoid intraoperative bleeding. Proper localization of the target point for fenestration is very important. And uh, when I started to operate on these patients, I was using a balloon inflation to enlarge the fenestration. I stopped using such uh, uh, inflation because uh, in all the three patients, uh, I had intraoperative hemorrhage and postoperative reclosure. Sharp fenestration is more safe uh, for multi-eliminated uh, cyst wall. And, but please avoid using diathermy close to important structures. Um, Another study documented the same observation and reported that intraoperative bleeding is one of the important factors predicting bad outcome. What about failure and recurrence? The procedure was successful in all the patients. Recurrence was reported in 9.4%. At second endoscopic procedure, all of them 
defenestration was closed and reopened. Long-term studies are very few in the literature and there is no information about secondary endoscopic procedure. And nobody knows the cause of recurrence. And if we don't know the cause of recurrence, of course, we will not be able to know how to avoid recurrence, but different recommendations are available in the literature by different authors, starting from placement of cisternal catheter, excision of outer cyst wall, devascularization of cyst wall. I like to make the size of fenestration as big as possible, so long that you are ensuring safety. Again, we published uh, uh, a response about middle cranial fossa arachnoid cyst to an editorial. Let me end my talk by this quotation taken from an editorial published in the Journal of Neurosurgery by Kandazami and Sweden. And regarding the recent publication of Dr. Elandur, we, with the reported admirable results, one would conclude that much of the ongoing debate regarding optimal management of middle cranial fossa arachnoid cysts has come to a closure. We are arranging hands-on workshops in Egypt about the ventricular endoscopy each year. This is a gathering photo with the president of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, Professor Franco Servadi, and all the attendees. Another workshop, it was in March 2019. This is my email for all young neurosurgeons who would like to join our hands-on workshop. We are offering scholarships and you are welcome after this pandemic will be terminated and we restore again our activities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Elnandur. Excellent lecture and congratulations for your publications. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Satoshi Kuroda and Nasser for this kind invitation and congratulations for this well-organized African-Asian collaboration educational course of the World Federation. Thank you, Professor Takuya Akai and Professor Samuel Zimber that you answer a lot of questions uh, on the, the chat for the, the people who was asking during uh, this lecture. I have two questions for you, uh, Nasser, please. Uh, what your policy when you have uh, uh, cerebral uh, temporal cyst incidental find, finding uh, is usual to find or after uh, brain trauma or uh, for investigation of headache? Uh, what your policy? Did you consider a Galaxy 3 policy to indicate surgery? And the second question is, uh, when you consider recurrence of uh, temporal cyst uh, is clinical or did you consider also image uh, to do a reoperation on this case? Okay, let's see about the first question. I, as I said in the lecture, uh, I, I only operate uh, if uh, the patient has symptoms. And so for incidentally finding cysts without symptoms, I would like to follow the patients uh, clinically and by doing uh, serial imaging. And uh, not only this, I also would like to operate only if the symptoms are related to, to the cyst. When the, the patient has headache, which is not specific to be due to the arachnoid cyst, usually I would like to do more investigations. Maybe we find another possible causes for this headache. Uh, and I'd like to wait and observe the patient uh, clinically and radiologically. I, I don't uh, know what is the second question, Nilsi. Uh, about recurrence, uh, the indication for reoperation. Ah, okay. About recurrence, uh, in this series, uh, we were able to follow up the patients for 55 months, and that's a long time, maybe about 4.6 years. Uh, if the patient uh, developing uh, symptoms post-operative, uh, that is an indication to repeat imaging. And if this is associated by increase in the cyst size postoperatively, this will be an indication for reoperation. Okay, thank you very much. There is, we have more time, Nasser, to yes, try you can to have answer some questions. the questions. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, we have Marian Sherman uh, asking about uh, chance. Uh, congratulate all the professor. 
uh, I would like to ask a question regarding arachnoid cysts, this general question. Would you recommend after fenestration of the cyst to leave the same valve on uh, already existing VP shunt do uh, hydrocephalus, or did you recommend change it for a programmable valve? Did you change or a flow or a reduction of pressure and cyst collapse coming from fenestrates of the cyst? Yossi, can I answer it? Yes, please, Samuel. Um, thanks, thanks for the question. It's a very nice question. Um, of course, neuroendoscopy, uh, arachnoid cyst is, is, is a field that was completely dominated by neuroendoscopy in the majority of, of, of locations. Of course, uh, some people like to use shunts in, in arachnoid cyst. I don't like to use it. If I have a patient, especially on, on the supracellar location, it's, it's necessary to, to, to say that uh, we have to define which, which site of, of, of uh, arachnoid cyst uh, are you asking? But uh, regarding the supracellars, if the patient has uh, a, a pre-existing VP shunt, I try to remove it uh, uh, during the, 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 the operative time, soon after the fenestration. I'm not afraid to do it. I, have, I had two cases previously shunted that I have to shunt again because the patient had uh, two, both patients had uh, meningitis before. So this is important to be aware if the patient had an infection because it, it has some impact in, in, in CSF uh, uh, absorption. But generally I try to, to, to remove the shunt at the same time uh, when we talk about uh, the, the supercellular cyst. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, there is uh, a question. When the fenestration, fa fenestration fail, uh, you already talked about Nasser. Uh, did you prefer to go again with fenestration or did you choose to uh, do a microscopic assisted approach? Or do you think that the second operation, uh, did you consider to put a shunt? Or you put a shunt only in the third failure if it just happened? Uh, let's see, I hate uh, inserting shunts, I hate putting tubes because of the high incidence of implanting such tubes, either stents or shunts generally. But uh, if uh, the procedure fails intraoperative, and that is a possibility because uh, sometimes uh, the anatomical landmarks are not, are not uh, so much clear and are not well identified. And the, for all young neurosurgeons who are interested in the endoscopy, if you are not confident 100% about the anatomical landmarks intraoperative, don't proceed by doing this procedure because it's going to be very risky and very dangerous. And if you have some ooze intraoperative bleeding, either venous or arterial, this will also make the water not clear and you'll not be able to identify the proper target point for fenestration. In such case, I would like to revert to microsurgical fenestration in the same setting. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Takuya uh, and uh, all the speakers, did you have a policy for one type of cyst uh, to start or to indicate for the first surgical procedure, uh, microscopical assist by endoscope uh, procedure, or did you prefer all the cases start with endoscope straight away, even in the posterior fossa cyst? No, no. It, it depends on the location of the cyst. And uh, for the interventricular cyst and the suprasura cyst, I will do by endoscope. But for the cerium fissure arachnoid cyst, I, we can do by endoscope or microscope, but I prefer to do by microscope because we are very familiar to microscopic procedures. And it's uh, very, we are confident to open the cyst into the base of systems for Syrian fissure. Okay, thank you. Some other comments? Uh, I, 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 I usually perform uh, the, the, the temporal cyst in the same fashion that, that Nasser does. 
I, I achieve generally good openings, but I do agree also with Takuya about the, the possibility and the also good results of microsurgical. Uh, I think both are, 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 are good techniques and depends on the experience of, of the surgeon. It, it became clear in the both uh, explanations, in the both presentations. Dr. Takuya, you like? Yes. May I ask to Professor uh, Anasel Erugandor, the, some arachnocyst has very uh, rigid tight membrane. And sometimes it's difficult to make a fenestration by uh, catheters. How do you treat in that case? Okay. We had some patients uh, that uh, we opened the, the basal cyst wall uh, by sharp fenestration, not by Fogarty. Yeah. Sometimes I'm using right. scissors. I think it's more safe than using uh, any coagulation at such areas. Yes, yes. If uh, the, the, the cyst wall is tough, and so it will not be opened by blunt perforation. In such case, it's much better to open the cyst wall by sharp fenestration using scissors, as I have seen yeah, in one scissors. of your videos. But you were oh, going okay. in very narrow angle between the optic mm -hmm, mm -hmm, nerve mm -hmm. and the carotid uh, and the and the internal yeah. carotid uh, uh, artery. But for uh, my patients, if I find that uh, the optical carotid angle is narrow, I don't risk. I prefer to go lateral below the oculomotor nerve to do my fenestration or between the internal carotid artery and the oculomotor nerve if there is enough rooming. Okay, thank you. So you use scissors? Yes, yes. I okay. use scissors in many patients uh, at which uh, the cyst wall was tough and yeah, not yes. easily perforatable mm -hmm. by the Fogarty. Okay, thank you. Uh, my experience, it was after the shunts on the cyst on the 90s during my fellow in Marseille with Professor Schultz already was with uh, microsurgery. And since in the 20s, uh, we start with uh, endoscopic surgery. And Samuel Zimberg was my teacher. Uh, Merci. Some... There's, a question, there's a question about the use of lasers. Oh. Uh, I would say that it can be used if you if you are familiar with the with your lasers. I don't use uh, routinely, but it can be used. No no problem. It's bad, but it's important to be familiar with the hardware you are using. It can be used if you want it. No problem. Okay. Final remarks for the professors because I think we advance on the next. Uh, symposium uh, time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Nasser, you thank you everyone. Thank you. And thanks for being with us this morning, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you very much, Nelsi, for moderating this session. Thanks to all speakers. Let us now start uh, the, the third session about the vascular and the vascular surgery. I introduce my friend, uh, and my brother, Professor Miguel Areis, he is a professor and chairman of neurosurgery at the University of Malaga in Spain. And he is uh, the chairman of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies Foundation. He is going to be the moderator of the next session. Thank you very much. Uh, my very good friend and brother as well. Uh, Professor Nasser El Gandul, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, excellent uh, session with uh, real giants of neurosurgery and vascular neurosurgery. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your very active and wonderful role as well as WFNS as second vice president for, for, for Africa. And congratulations for this initiative. Uh, without uh, much delay, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Shinichi Yoshimura to start his presentation on aneurysm uh, endovascular surgery. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, our experience of uh, aneurysm treatment with endovascular therapy. Uh, this is a treatment number 
of cerebral aneurysm in our department, the number is increasing by year like this and see the rate of the endovascular treatment uh, indicated as blue is also increasing already is more than 70 percent uh, treated by endovascular therapy uh, this is a um, um, surgery group uh, this graph showing the uh, majority of the target of the surgery is now MCA and ACOM. On the other hand, in endovascular treatment group, majority is paracranial aneurysm and PCOM ACOM. Uh, this is a critical result of our treatment for unruptured aneurysm and left side uh, indicate the endovascular group. It shows the complication rate is 1.7% uh, uh, and uh, among them we experience three uh, complications. Uh, see these three are all large or giant aneurysm. So I'd like to move to the talk about the pipeline flow diverter. This pipeline is the first generation flow diverter. It was introduced to our country several years ago. And this is one of the typical case. This 55 years old male is actually, he, he was a radiologist. He noticed left visual disturbance when he was looking at the a computer and he performed the MRI by himself and it showed the supracellular lesion like this. And MRI showed a large aneurysm at left paracrinoid per, uh, portion and maximum diameter was 15.8 millimeter. And the neck was relatively small. So we thought that the, this might be treated by balloon assisted coiling but he preferred to receive a flow diverter treatment because he was expecting improvement of visual acuity. So he strongly requested me to treat the pipeline only, not to use coil. So I followed his uh, opinion and uh, fortunately, aneurysm was completely uh, disappeared on the follow-up uh, DSA uh, performed 12 months later. And uh, when we look at the source image of the MRA, uh, just after treatment, aneurysm was demonstrated like this, but gradually it was uh, diminished in size and nine months later, it was gone. And the benefit of the fluoride is uh, mass reduction. Uh, this slide shows our experience of flow diverter in our department. Total number is 134 patients and the max, uh, maximum diameter was uh, uh, 30 millimeter in average. Actually, recently we uh, performed this treatment by local anesthesia mainly and the final result is like this, uh, 92 0.5% shows molecular ranking 0 to 1, relatively good. And also this slide shows changes of modified ranking scale and uh, see the uh, modified ranking 0 or rate is increasing by year. So I was so happy with this. However, on the other hand, there are some risk factors for flow diverter treatment. Let's see one by one. Uh, first of all, a giant aneurysm because complication rate is higher in giant aneurysm compared to large or small aneurysms. This is a relationship between aneurysm size and complication in a previous study in the US interpret and see the complication rate in giant aneurysm are much higher compared to small or large aneurysms. And also 
spontaneous rupture uh, indicated in red color is uh, 5.8% in giant aneurysm, but it is much less in large aneurysm. It was only 0.5% and also nothing in small aneurysm. So when we treat giant aneurysm with pro diverter, we should uh, pay attention to these higher rate complication, including spontaneous rupture. So this patient is a 60 years old female uh, having a, a progressive visual acuity a, a decrease and the aneurysm size was growing. So what should we do? Uh, we discussed and we performed the coiling plus pipeline deployment like this. And the aneurysm was completely obliterated six months later. This was this is uh, one of the choice recently. A second risk factor is tortuous access route because navigation of guiding and the micro catheter is difficult. So this uh, 62 years old female noticed the propia and the right cavernous giant aneurysm was uh, observed on MRA. A DSA showed a giant aneurysm, but I felt that that might be treated by flow diverter. However, when we looked at the cervical portion, it was like this. So we tried to navigate the catheter, but it was impossible. So we opened the cervical portion and I exposed the uh, internal carotid artery. It was like this, uh, coiled. Uh, so I sutured the one of the part and uh, punctured. And next I navigated the angiosis like this and move to uh, flow diverter treatment. This was done in hybrid OR and uh, uh, but unfortunately, micro catheter uh, couldn't reach to peripheral part. It was almost impossible to, to do a, a pipeline treatment. So we shifted to the surgery. And now I'm doing off the spin on the reach and opening the uh, severe fissure. And I bypass the radial artery graft. And finally, I cut the proximal part of ICA and connect to the radial artery graft and the high flow bypass was performed. Fortunately, uh, surgery was successful and the aneurysm was completely it disappeared on six months later on MRA and patient eye movement was fully recovered and she was happy. Third one is uh, branching from the dome or fusiform aneurysm because there is a risk of thrombosis in branches and perforators after flu diverter treatment. When the aneurysm doesn't have any branch, it's easy. We can simply deploy the flu diverter and the aneurysm will be thrombosed well. When the aneurysm has a branch at the neck, it might be okay. Cure rate is decreased, but uh, if we combine with the coiling, it can be treated. But if the aneurysm has a big branch from the dome, what should we do? It is like this. So, uh, even after deployment of flow diverter, flow remains and the aneurysm will not cure. So, stenting in the branch and the parent artery and the coiling might be one of the choice, but it may recur. So, creeping is better if the aneurysm has an important branch from the bone. Uh, how about the fusiform aneurysm treatment? If 
the, there are some uh, perforators from the dome. After deployment of Frodebata aneurysm and the perforators will be thrombosed. So we cannot spare these branches, but perforator from the parent artery will remain. So this is uh, one of the typical case of growing MCA giant Fujiform aneurysm. She noticed headache and uh, received the MRA and also DSA, it was like this. Uh, M M1 proximal part was very uh, small length and the M1 distal part was only two millimeter in size. And unfortunately, uh, anterior cordial artery and the uh, PCOM uh, seems to be attached, adhered to the dome of the aneurysm. Maximum size of the aneurysm was uh, larger than 25 millimeter. It was giant aneurysm. So these two were uh, severely uh, adhered. So we saw that uh, it might be treated by Frodebata, but uh, I've heard that uh, A1 should be jailed by Frodebata, so it might be thrombosed. And uh, if there are some perforators on the dome, uh, we cannot save it. So we firstly look at the distal part of MCA. So we confirmed many LSA branch from the M2 site like this. So we may be able to occlude the aneurysm itself or even treat treated by uh, Frodebata. We we could not we cannot save the perforator from the dome. So we perform the uh, bypass to just distal to the uh, aneurysm. The and uh, we perform the angiography. It was uh, in a uh, hybrid OR. And uh, uh, after clipping of the distal part of the aneurysm, um, MEP didn't disappear. So we decided to embolize the uh, aneurysm by coil. It was uh, successfully embolized like this. And this was the last angiography. Uh, distal part of MC was perfused by bypass. So it was like this. And how was the result? Unfortunately, we saw some infarction in basal ganglia. And bypass was patent and annulus was completely obliterated. However, patient was fine like this. There were no deficit. She could work and no hemparesis. So we were so happy with this. A uh, bifurcation aneurysm is a very difficult target to reach it by a flow diverter because one of the branches will be jailed. It is like this. Uh, treatment is easy, but together with the aneurysm, jailed branch will also be thrombosed. So, Stent, Y stent, or T stent, and coiling would be the choice. But if we look at the branch from this direction, it is jailed by stent mesh. So this mesh may cause thrombosis. So we cannot stop antiplatelet. So recently, in new devices are introduced. So one of them is pulse slider. Uh, this is uh, like this, and uh, we can stop antiplatelet compared to a uh, stent treatment. We can stop three or six months later. Or another device is intrasacral flow diameter wave. It was just introduced to our country. Uh, my question is, a flow diameter can be applied for small aneurysm? Yes, it is, because premier study showed that uh, flow diameter for 
small aneurysm provided very low rate of complication. Major stroke or death was only 2.2% in this trial. So indication of pro-diabetes pipeline was in, uh, expanded to five millimeter or larger and also uh, tibial artery was also indicated. Very recently, new flow FRED was introduced to our country. It is a dual layered flow And the difference of the uh, indication of, of this device is uh, yellow colored part, IC terminus, proximal portion of AC and MCA, and basilar artery are also indicated for this device. We experienced 35 cases with this device and no complication rate. Uh, this is an annual trend of cerebral annual treatment in our country. Number of uh, the vascular therapy is increasing by year. 10 to 20 years ago, it was like this. Surgery was much stronger compared to endovascular therapy, but now, it is like this. So it's not time for arm um, wrestling. It's time to shake hands or it's time to be a hybrid neurosurgeon. This is a textbook of a hybrid neurosurgeon in our country. And this samurai has two sword, surgery sword and endovascular sword. We have been receiving many overseas visitors want to be a hybrid new surgeons like this. We are happy with them. And this is my message. Based on good clinical results, the number of fluorodibata treatment is increasing and its indication is widened. However, we should select surgical treatment when endovascular therapy is high risk. If you master endovascular technique together with surgery, you can treat more patients having cerebral aneurysms. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Yoshimura, for this uh, elegant and comprehensive presentation regarding what is, uh, to my mind, the best option in the hands of neurosurgeon, the possibility just to do endovascular treatment or microsurgical treatment. And I think we will uh, have the discussion at the end of the three presentation. And now this is uh, for me a, a great honor and great pleasure just to ask Professor Spessler to start his presentation. Professor Spessler doesn't need any presentation because uh, I think he's the masters of masters um, his so many contribution in many fields are absolutely outstanding. He has trained uh, dozens and dozens of neurosurgeons that nowadays, nowadays are uh, also leading neurosurgery in many places all around the world, and many of them, of course, in, in the States. And I think that uh, we have to very carefully uh, hear uh, his presentation because uh, his presentation are about not only about technical issues but also the way neurosurgeons has to do neurosurgery uh, from the very beginning to the to the end how to uh, to run units how to um, join teams how to be the real leader of neurosurgery that uh, Professor Spessler is. So Professor Spessler, your presentation, why clipping of brain aneurysm should continue. Um, thank you, Miguel. Um, thank you, Nasser, for including me in this presentation. Um, I, it's a pleasure to be here. And I uh, really enjoyed the previous uh, uh, presentation. I think uh, it was very well done and made a lot of essential points. I'm going to very quickly review um, what this debate is really about. And the question is coiling superior. And if you look at all the, all the randomized studies, there was no difference except in ISAT of one year 
but not at five and 10 years except for death. And so they changed the endpoint at 10 years. But the concerns really are patient selection, durability, replating, coil migration. And if you look at ISAT, the only endpoint that was significant was in the 2005 report after one year. When we looked at five years, there was no significant difference. And when you looked at 10 years, which was restricted to the English cohort, there was uh, a difference only in depth, no longer in, in subarachnoid hemorrhage or in uh, modified Rankin score, but in TEP. However, if you really looked at what the treatment was for, they had a higher rebleed rate for coil treated aneurysms, uh, which was uh, 49 uh, versus 23 with 16 death in the coil treatment group as opposed to 12 with, uh, uh, with clipping. So at what was required in ISAD was equipoise. And that meant that the endovascular surgeon and the microsurgeon both thought that this aneurysm was appropriate for either treatment. They were almost all in the anterior circulation and uh, only 22% of all the candidates were enrolled. Most of them were excellent grades, much better than in Brad and which I'll discuss in a minute. Commitment was quite different. There was a 15 hour delay for clip aneurysm as opposed to endovascular treatment. And that resulted in 11 more subarachnoid hemorrhages and 12 death prior to the treatment. Since this was an intent to treat, obviously those still went into surgical uh, morbidity and mortality, even though surgery had never been done. There was no post-op uh, documentation required for CLIP cohort, which I think is just unacceptable. Despite the fact before a patient could be entered, both the endovascular surgeon and the microsurgeon had to agree that they were appropriate for both treatments, 30 patients when they were looked at um, at surgery were not clipped and 26 of them were then coiled. Also important is that we had almost a 20% retreatment in the coiled cohort. In order to compare ISAD with BRAD, which is our prospective uh, trial, we had 318 anterior um, circulation aneurysm. There was good parity between those assigned to coil. It was also an intent to treat, just like uh, ISAD. And if you look, uh, at one year, three year, et cetera, there's really no significant difference. If anything, if you looked at 10 year, um, the, uh, it was certainly more favorable toward clipping, but certainly did not reach uh, any significant. CF stands for carry forward. That means if a patient was not seen at 10 years, then whatever the exam was at six years was carried forward to minimize my, uh, uh, any, any um, effect of not including patients. Important, as opposed to ISAT, there was no difference in the 10th, in, in death at any time, 10 year, 33%, 33%, with carry forward, 26%, 26%. So absolutely no difference. What are we treating these aneurysms for? When, when somebody dies from trauma or, 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 or from heart disease, and naturally, our treatment doesn't affect it. So death is a tough one. Retreatment, aneurysm obliteration, subarachnoid hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage in death. If you looked at the prospective study, 20%, almost the same as, as an ISAD, uh, patients required retreatment. Less than 1% for those that were clipped. When you looked at aneurysm obliteration, adjudicated by an independent neuro um, uh, radiologist. At 10 years, only 22% of patients that were coiled had complete obliteration as opposed to 93% uh, that were clipped. Rebleeding and death. There were two subarachnoid hemorrhages in the 83 patients that were coiled and, there were, and both those patients died. So uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage and death, which is really what we're treating, 
um, was benefited by clipping as opposed to coiling. So why continue to clip? These are my regions. Surgical improvements also continue. Best treatment for long-term control of aneurysm for recurrence, coil migration, failure, bypass requirements. As, as the previous speaker beautifully demonstrated this important aspect of aneurysm treatment, when there's a big mass effect, when we have blister aneurysm, and again, beautifully demonstrated by the previous speaker, difficult endovascular access. So I'm gonna show you just a few examples of those. I think surgical improvements, it is the, the beauty of uh, endovascular treatment is that it has put the onus on the microsurgeon to really minimize every possible risk. And uh, in many of the previous uh, presentations, some of these were mentioned, but we remember ICG angiography, we have lighted instruments, et cetera, et cetera. We can go all the way to cardiac standstill. And then finally, I think we need to be gentle to the brain. So I have gone retractorless for decades and more than 97% of all the cases I do did not include any rigid retraction. I like sitting because you're much more comfortable. You don't see uh, master uh, pianists standing up uh, to play uh, the piano you are, your support makes you a better surgeon. And that's how we do it. Technology, uh, non-stick bipolars, I think are very important, but we have lighted instruments. We have the surgery scope now, the adenosine. So the difference, this is for a small calf male in the brainstem. If we bring in the lighted bipolars, we have a beautiful visualization as opposed to just looking straight down. And that's because the visual axis um, and uh, the light axis come in at different angles between three to six degrees. So instead of doing this, we want to do this. And here's a little cartoon that sort of emphasizes that. And I call this dynamic retractions. You're still retracting, but you're using your instrument. So it's constantly changing and it's focused on where you're going. This is forceps on the dentate ligament that's been cut, just general retraction. And look how much ischemia you have just from that little pulling up. As soon as we release the dentate, these vessels begin to fit normally. If you think retraction doesn't hurt the brain, you are wrong. We also have new approaches. We minimize operations. Uh, you can do a uh, eyebrow incision, come down and still be able to treat uh, these aneurysms. This is a uh, PCOM and an anterior choroidal artery aneurysms, third nerve attached to the third nerve, and it ruptured. And despite this very small opening, you had plenty of room, couldn't clip it directly, so proximal clip, distal clip, and then clipping the aneurysm, and then fixing the rough clipping with an additional clip and then the uh, anterior choroidal and patient did just fine. Why continue to clip? We're gonna talk about recurrence and coil migration. Here's a patient that was treated in Philadelphia by a superb endovascular surgeon. Six years later, we see this patient comes and sees us. So here we have recurrence of the aneurysm and we have migration of the coils outside of the aneurysm. Coil migration is more common than we give it credit to because it takes time. Here is a patient I saw that had a visual deficit. Eight years after coiling, the coils had migrated out of the aneurysm into the optic nerve. This is a neuro-ophthalmologist at the BNI. She was treated by our endovascular surgeon. Beautiful result for an posterior communicating artery aneurysm. Three years later, she presented with a progressive third nerve palsy. You see the coils migrating into the third nerve. Failure of implanted hardware, bypass requirement, and mass effect. As opposed to the previous speaker's case of a beautiful case of putting in a flow diverter, let's look at this one. Nine years old, 
has this aneurysm, incidental, no deficit. He was treated on an outside institution. First pipeline, you had persistent filling of the aneurysm and follow-up in imaging. Subsequently, they placed a total of seven pipeline stents over two years with evidence of persistent filling. He developed loss of vision after the first stent placement in, one, in the uh, ipsilateral eye, then has had progressive worsening vision since subsequent stent placement. So at this point, he had no light perception in the right eye, and he had no light perception in the temporal hemifield in the left eye. And this is what it looked like. These are the seven stents. You looked at the mass, and this is the problem. Basically, the first run looks good, and then you see the extravasation into the aneurysm, uh, which with progressive enlargement and progressive visual loss. So we ended up um, doing a bypass. Uh, here's, we're looking at the stents right here in the carotid artery. We wanted to free up the optic nerve and basically ended up doing a bypass from the bottom up and eliminated the aneurysm. Uh, Post-operative MRI, MRI, uh, there was no change. It's now dark, but you see the bypass coming in. And then three months post-op, he had dramatic improvement in vision and the mass is pretty much gone. And he recovered actually complete vision uh, despite the fact that he was blind in this uh, one eye beforehand. So I, I think we've gotta be careful because failure of implanted hardware, there is no prospective study of flow diverters compared uh, to microsurgery. Here's one that was coiled and stended three times, recurred, no retractor in place, but obviously the aneurysm ruptured with a, uh, with a clip. So we sacrificed the internal carotid artery right where the aneurysm comes off. We, we were prepared for a bypass. You see the stents in the one. And here's where I used a retractor, put it on the temporal lobe just to decrease the pulsations and then did a radial artery graft from the middle cerebral artery to the internal uh, or common carotid artery. And this is what it looked like. And at six months, it's not filling not only the entire ipsilateral hemisphere, but going across and filling some of the uh, anterior circulation as well. Mass effect. When we look at a case like this, doesn't look very impressive right here, but in fact is we have an aneurysm that is of this size. On MRI, you can see it here. We did a craniotomy, we debulked the aneurysm on down to where it was, and then with multiple clips, we're able to reconstruct the aneurysm neck And this is what it looked like post-op. Aneurysm is decompressed, normal exam. Blister aneurysm. When you have an aneurysm, a subarachnoid hemorrhage like this, perfectly normal angiogram, repeated the angiogram before discharge, and you see this blister aneurysm on the basilar artery. So going in through a modified OC approach, we're coming down sacrifice the posterior communicating artery. Now we're looking right at the basilar artery, contralateral SCA, contralateral third nerve, contralateral PCA, aneurysm sitting right here, ipsilateral PCA, ipsilateral superior cerebellar artery, and here's the aneurysm. So we wanna be sure that we're not putting any traction on it whatsoever. I like to use a little cotton and then apply the clip in such a way that we're forcing it down and then making sure all the perforations are out and here's the post-op and done just fine. Difficult endovascular access. This is at the P2, P3. Easy through a supracerebellar infratentorial approach. We dissect it all out. You can see the scarring, preserving all the little vessels. 
and getting down to being able to clip it and eliminating it completely, keeping all the branches intact. Same thing for a tough, tough Ica aneurysm because this Ica aneurysm is coming off Ica itself. And so what we did, we worked very hard. This is just through a retrosigmoid approach, no retractor in place. You saw the sixth nerve, that's basilar artery, that's Ica. These that branch off Ica. So this is embedded in the brain stem. So we spend a long time getting it out, attached to the pia arachnoid. Sixth cranial nerve, no retractor, no CSF drainage, just what we get out with our sucker. And we clear up the space so that we can put a clip into the opening we made next to the brain stem and eliminate it. And then you can see an ICG, all the vessels are open. And post-op, you see the aneurysm completely gone with the clip. When you have branches arising from the dome, um, as you do here, then this is a good case for, here's the, the, the main branch coming up, clipping off the blood vessels that are coming out of the aneurysm, then taking the aneurysm out altogether. And then I take the proximal middle cerebral artery and attach both these branches to that one vessel. And once that's done, then I do an STA, SCA, and it's patent, an STA, SCA to the third branch. And this is what we have afterwards. That's what we did. And here you can see that's the middle cerebral artery branch filling both of these and the STA, SCA filling the branch that's missing here. And here's the residual of the aneurysm. Giant ruptured middle cerebral artery. So how do we treat these? Well, pretty straightforward. When you have all of this here, we need to analyze the case and we wanna look at it. We see middle cerebral artery. First thing we notice it, that, it, that there's a branch to the aneurysm and all the clips. Second thing we notice is that we can preserve this portion of the middle cerebral artery. Third thing we notice is that the anterior temporal artery is still intact. So what we ended up doing is we wanna clip this and do a bypass to the distal outflow of this branch. And so that's what we're gonna do. We get proximal, that's the anterior temporal artery. 11 0 sutures to the distal branch past the aneurysm. And then we clip proximal, that branch, to the aneurysm, and that eliminates flow into it. And this is what we have. If you look at it now, anterior temporal artery filling this portion, middle cerebral artery continuing there, and she did not turn a hair. So in conclusion, I wanna show you this last case. I don't think there's an endovascular option for this one. And this is again, without a retractor, that's a dissection of A2, we cut it off. And then we use the frontal polar branch on the other side to patch that opening, both as a extra insurance and in order to make room. And that's what it looked like. And here you see in video, but what we did, the little cartoon and that patches it up and that's the ultimate reward. So why sh clipping of aneurysm should continue? Remember that in Brad, 36% of the patients that were uh, supposed to be treated endovascular, the endovascular surgeon crossed them over from coiling the clipping. That's more than a third. No significant morbidity and mortality difference at any time between them. Risk of rebleeding, retreatment and obliteration favor clipping. Nuances, bypass, mass effect, blister aneurysm, difficult endovascular access will make sure that we will continue to clip. Collaborative efforts with our very, very talented endovascular colleagues is absolutely essential. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Spessler, for this uh, outstanding presentation that has absolutely 
clearly answer why clipping of brain aneurysm should continue. I think that uh, after your presentation, there will be uh, many questions that uh, we will have at the end of, of the session. And uh, now is uh, time for Dr. Satoshi Kuroda, who is going to uh, speak uh, on bypass surgery for complex aneurysm. I'd like to take uh, advantage uh, of this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Kuroda for his uh, work as co-chairman of the Education and Training Committee of WFNS. Uh, Professor Spitzer, could you, could you stop uh, sharing? Yes, thank you. I guess uh, uh, all of audience uh, has have been uh, very tired because uh, uh, all of you are here. The many many excellent lectures, and now uh, I am a little bit uh, nervous because uh, I have to talk after uh, uh, Master of Master Professor Spetra. And uh, also, I am a little bit uh, sleepy because uh, it is almost uh, zero o'clock a.m. in in Japan. Anyway, uh, uh, I start uh, my lecture on bypass surgery for complex aneurysms. Historically, um, Professor Sant from the uh, United States, uh, far from the many, many uh, bypass surgery for uh, com complex uh, aneurysm. Uh, his uh, results are uh, uh, summarized in his uh, very famous uh, monograph like this. And uh, in this monograph, uh, he precisely uh, presents the uh, methodology of uh, uh, high flow uh, bypass surgery using a saphenous vein graft like this. And uh, uh, Professor Kamiyama from Japan, uh, he is uh, my uh, great mentor. Uh, he started uh, to perform uh, uh, bypass surgery for complex aneurysm in uh, uh, 1980s. This is uh, one example of uh, uh, pike a pike uh, anastomosis with uh, side to side anastomosis fashion for a uh, uh, pike involving uh, vertebral artery dissection. Um, at the same time, uh, Professor Ausman from Detroit performed the uh, uh, pike a pike uh, bypass with uh, uh, end to side anastomosis fashion for the same aneurysm. Professor Kamiyama uh, developed uh, uh, excellent radial artery uh, graft bypass for a uh, uh, giant uh, IC aneurysm like that. Uh, these are uh, his uh, drawing. This is the one example of uh, radial artery uh, graft and uh, couched uh, occlusion for a giant uh, cavernous uh, IC aneurysm. Uh, he, he further uh, developed uh, uh, many, many um, reconstructive uh, bypass surgery uh, left side, this is uh, uh, a V3 uh, radial artery M2 bypass for a uh, uh, bilateral internal carotid artery occlusion. And uh, uh, this example is a uh, uh, V3 to vagal artery uh, graft bypass for a uh, uh, fusiholmic uh, vagal aneurysm. And also, uh, as you know, um, 
high flow bypass using a saphenous vein graft or radial artery graft uh, can be applied for a uh, uh, burista like annulus of the uh, dorsal internal carotid artery. And also a uh, intracranial to intracranial uh, in situ bypass uh, for uh, uh, MCA or ICA uh, fusiformic annulus. Uh, these uh, bypass have been uh, uh, performed by Professor Spetra, Professor Seeker, and uh, Professor Rotom. In summary, uh, there are many types of uh, bypass surgery for uh, uh, complex aneurysm. This is a summary. Uh, we can use uh, uh, a branch of uh, external carotid artery like uh, SDA or uh, occipital artery to uh, M2 branch, M4 branch, or uh, uh, A3 branches. Uh, SDA can be uh, anastomosed to a PCA and SCA2. And uh, the occipital artery can be anastomosed uh, to the pica and the ica. And uh, radial artery graft or saphenous vein graft can be used to a uh, uh, M2 branch or A3 branch. And uh, more importantly, this uh, uh, graft can be applied to basal artery or P PCA. And also uh, uh, in situ uh, IC to IC bypass between uh, MCA branches and the ACA branches uh, also very useful uh, to reconstruct the intracranial arteries. Now uh, mm, I will present uh, three examples of uh, bypass surgery for a complex aneurysm. This uh, old guy uh, developed a subarachnoid hemorrhage and the intracerebral hemorrhage. And uh, you, you can see a uh, uh, severe subarachnoid hemorrhage and uh, uh, hematoma around the left basal ganglia and also a uh, uh, rupture to the ventricular system. A 3D CT angiography uh, demonstrated a very big aneurysm uh, were involved uh, in the IC terminals and the origins of uh, ACA and MCA like that. So uh, uh, I decided uh, to make uh, uh, STA to M2 double anastomosis at the first, dissecting the uh, STA and then make a front temporal craniotomy and expose the uh, two branches of uh, uh, M2 segments. And uh, this is the internal carotid artery and then this is the neck of the aneurysm here like that. At first, uh, uh, I anastomosed uh, STA branches uh, to the uh, posterior trunk of uh, M2. The procedure for bypass is uh, very popular, so I will skip.
and uh, another bypass uh, for uh, anterior trunk of uh, M2 branch. Finish the bypass. And then uh, uh, I attacked the aneurysm. At first, uh, I dissected the anterior choroidal artery from the aneurysm. And uh, I clipped the origin of the ACA because uh, uh, in this case, uh, the anterior communicating artery was uh, well developed. And then uh, uh, I clipped the uh, uh, ICA just the start to uh, the anterior choroidal artery. And finally, uh, I clipped the origin of uh, middle cerebral artery with uh, uh, two clips because the uh, uh, MCA was very atherosclerotic. And I checked the flow. and uh, punctured the uh, uh, aneurysm dome. And uh, finally, uh, I removed the uh, hematoma. Uh, this is a post-operative CT scan. And uh, this is a, a post-operative 3D CT angiography. Uh, these are the uh, STA M2 anastomosis and uh, uh, aneurysm uh, was gone after clipping. And the uh, uh, second uh, example is the uh, uh, fusiholomic aneurysm of the uh, M2 trunk. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, second case is uh, uh, a giant cavernous IC aneurysm. This uh, lady uh, developed a generalized uh, seizure uh, due to uh, hypnaturemia. And uh, uh, a precise examination uh, revealed that uh, uh, she had the uh, pan hypopituitarism due to a uh, uh, huge uh, aneurysm. This is the uh, 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 3D uh, DSA of the uh, right internal carotid artery. And uh, 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 this is the uh, 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 brachial arte arteriography and uh, we should check the connection between uh, radial artery and the urinary artery, like that. This is the uh, uh, operative field. At first, uh, I harvested the radial artery and then uh, dissect the STA branches. and I made a, a standard front temporal craniotomy. Opened the uh, dura mater and uh, uh, made a tunnel between the head and the neck like that. And uh, opened the cerebrum fissure and exposed the M2 branches At first, uh, uh, I made a standard STA M4 anastomosis for uh, insurance. 
during uh, uh, radial artery uh, graft anastomosis. And then uh, uh, I passed the uh, radial arteries through the uh, tunnel like that and start the uh, uh, radial artery graft bypass And then uh, uh, I anastomose the radial artery to the external uh, carotid artery. Finally, uh, uh, I uh, ligated the internal carotid artery. I see the video on geography. This is the serum of the uh, operation. Mm, aneurysm uh, was uh, rapidly thrombosed and uh, gradually decreased in size and uh, her pituitary function uh, completely uh, recovered. This is a third case, uh, M2 fusiformic aneurysm. I made the, uh, uh, this is aneurysm. I made the uh, uh, STA, um, MCA uh, double anastomosis. At first, uh, make a bypass uh, to the M4 branches. And then uh, uh, I made a second bypass uh, to the uh, M3 portion. Like that. This is completely same technique. Then uh, uh, I trapped the aneurysm. And uh, I Inside the uh, aneurysm. Mm. Before surgery, uh, we made a uh, uh, 3D printing of this aneurysm like that. And uh, this is uh, uh, incised aneurysm. It's quite natural uh, that uh, uh, both are completely same. This is a, a post-operative uh, 3D CT angiography. Uh, uh, Dub anastomosis is patent. 
As the Professor Yoshimura uh, uh, talked in his uh, lecture, recently uh, uh, flow diverter uh, is uh, available for such uh, complex aneurysm like uh, giant uh, cavernous IC aneurysm and also uh, recent studies uh, has shown that the uh, um, stent and the coiling uh, can be applied to uh, uh, blood blister like uh, aneurysm of the ICA. But uh, uh, as Professor uh, Spetra uh, talked in his lecture, uh, such uh, treatment effect is still uh, controversial, I think. So uh, uh, the audience, uh, maybe uh, uh, young neurosurgeons in Asia and Africa. So uh, you should uh, uh, try to um, be an uh, excellent uh, micro neurosurgeons who can be, who can uh, complete uh, uh, clipping and uh, bypass surgeries for uh, complex aneurysm. Um, so opportunity for uh, uh, microsurgery may be uh, decreasing, but uh, I think microsurgery will not uh, disappear in the future. So, uh, I hope uh, you will try to be an excellent uh, microsurgeon in the future. And, and, uh, in the end of my lecture, I would like to uh, announce that uh, uh, very new books on uh, Moya Moya disease uh, will be uh, published uh, by uh, Spring uh, uh, companies uh, in the uh, next March. So if you are interested, uh, please uh, read uh, this book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kuroda, for this elegant and wonderful presentation. Very nice cases, beautiful technique. I think we are a little behind a schedule. So we have uh, something between uh, five, 10 minutes, no more for discussion. Um, Professor Spessler has uh, another commitment. So, uh, well, first of all, I like to mention that uh, in the, the chat is plenty of congratulation for the three speakers. I think we have been gathering uh, by means of this presentation, the full spectrum regarding uh, energy uh, management nowadays. There is uh, one question for uh, Dr. Yoshimura from Dr. Uh, Holpagol uh, regarding the possibility of migration of the pipeline and also when does he uh, advise starting uh, anti, uh, anti uh, coagulation therapy and, and when to stop after pipeline uh, flow diverter uh, treatment? Oh, thank you for your question. Uh... I experienced one case of uh, pipeline migration. Uh, it was actually shortened during time course and aneurysm neck was uncovered. So uh, aneurysm recurrent. So we uh, performed the coiling for the uh, recurred aneurysm and uh, deployed one more uh, pipeline in it. So, but uh, uh, migration is actually uh, rare rare complication. So and recently we switched to the new flow diverter, FRET, uh, in our uh, 35 uh, cases, there was no oh, migration after the treatment. Thank you very much. And uh, regarding when to start anticoagulation, anti-aggregant, uh, anti-platelet uh, aggregation therapy, uh, and when to stop? Mm, yes, that's a good question, but uh, there is not a firm answer for that. Um, 
when we treat the patient with antiplatelet plus anticoagulant, we reduce the uh, antiplatelet to single, okay? Aspirin or clopidogrel plus uh, DOAC. DOAC should be used because uh, warfarin has a higher rate of uh, hemorrhagic complication in usual. So we select DOAC plus clopidogrel recently. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, I have uh, one question uh, mainly for for the two uh, speakers from, from Japan. What is the percentage of uh, uh, <clears throat> radiologists, neuroradiologists versus neurosurgeons doing endovascular uh, treatment for aneurysm? Uh, yeah, in, in our country, uh, more than 90% uh, of the aneurysm uh, are treated by neurosurgeon, even by endovascular therapy. So oh, we are the main player, neurosurgeons are main player for aneurysm <laughs> treatment. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing uh, Professor Spessler driving, mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's a, 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 a space uh, aircraft or wherever, or it's a, it's a car, yeah. he's doing something <laughs> like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, Miguel, yeah, Miguel, I, I, I really do think that the neurosurgeon has the right mindset. And if right. he has the right skill set, they are better endovascular surgeons. I know I'm stepping on all sorts of toes, but I agree with the Japanese philosophy 100%. And the endovascular neurosurgeon and the endovascular specialists at the Baron Neurological Institute are superb neurosurgeons. Absolutely, this is uh, this is good. I think we have uh, we have uh, maybe two three minutes more for for some comment. I think what is in everybody's mind is um, something about the issue that the ideal way of dealing with energy uh, problem is uh, by means of uh, endovascular and microvascular treatment, and of course uh, with uh, bypass techniques. So I think what what is I think what is in everybody's mind is the question from uh, just addressed to Dr. Spessler. What is uh, your advice for those young neurosurgeons that wants to become expert in aneurysm surgery? Uh, it, it's tough because I think uh, the endovascular techniques are progressing uh, rapidly. They're very good, and that means that the microsurgeon is really confronted with very difficult aneurysms, the giant aneurysms, the ones that require bypass, the mass effect, et cetera. However, what's also true today is that you can do virtual leading, you can uh, uh, learning, you can do robotic learning. We have so many incredible courses for, for getting to the very top of your microsurgical skills that I think for many, being both endovascular and microsurgeons is possible. But if you're at a major institution, I would prefer having specialists in both fields to be really at the cutting edge. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a, another question from uh, for Dr. Kuroda. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, um, I think that the indication for, for bypass surgery are not many, many. What is your advice for those who want to, you know, be expert in such a sophisticated uh, technique of revascularization? Mm, I think uh, uh, at first, uh, uh, mm, of the job training is uh, uh, essential for young neurosurgeons using a, a silicone tube or something. That's the first step. And uh, mm, very fortunately, uh, we uh, Japanese uh, neurosurgeons uh, can't perform uh, uh, standard STA MC anastomosis for uh, carotid occlusion or uh, middle cerebral artery occlusion. So uh, mm, now uh, I am recommending uh, my uh, resident or uh, younger uh, colleagues to perform uh, uh, 
standard STMSA anastomosis uh, perfectly. That's the second uh, uh, steps, I think. And finally, uh, uh, bypass surgery for Moya Moya disease is the uh, uh, final goal as a bypass surgeon, I think. So uh, uh, then uh, uh, we can manage uh, um, complex aneurysm by using bypass surgery, I think. Thank you. And um, what could be the minimum uh, of procedures required to, you know, to have good results in bypass surgery? You mean uh, the number of surgery? Yes, um, per year. Uh, I, I guess uh, uh, um, 20 surgeries, minimally necessary, okay. I think. Okay. Thank you very much. So I think that uh, we don't have much time. Um, I'm, I'm sure everybody wants to hear from our senior and um, very well respected Professor Spessler some last remark before giving the, the word to uh, my brother, uh, Professor El Gandur, to close the, this session. Uh, Professor Spessler? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you, Miguel. I, I, I'm, I'm not really sure I like the fact that you keep pointing out how old I am. <laughs> No, no, no. Um, but, <laughs> I, no, no, no. But, but I, I would say that <laughs> after all the years uh, that I have spent in this field and after all the complex surgeries I've had the privilege to do, this is still by far the very, very best occupation you can possibly have. And we are all privileged to be part of it. And I enthusiastically recommend to our young colleagues that they just enhance their microsurgical skills recognize the endovascular uh, advantages and do whatever they do to their patients that they, they would do for themselves or their loved ones. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't want to disturb you much because I don't know whether you are in the UK driving, uh, you know, at the right side or... or <laughs> My wife is driving. Yes, take care of this uh, great man. So I'm, I'm, I'm relaxed. You are not driving. And uh, this yeah, is. I'm not driving. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I think this is time to ask uh, our uh, beloved Professor El Gandur. Uh, to say something and close this wonderful session. Thank you, uh, Professor Yoshimura. Thank you, uh, Professor Kuroda. Thank you, Professor Spessler, for wonderful talks and your time this weekend. And now, Professor El Gandur, this is your time. Thank you also for giving me this great honor to take part of this session, of moderating this uh, great uh, and giant uh, neuroscience. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, at the end of this uh, symposium, I would like to thank all our distinguished speakers and moderators. Thanks to all of you for contributing to this neurosurgical activity and for giving us much of your time and experience. I have important announcement, Professor Nelson Yasiko, President-elect of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies, and myself, we are organizing a very important uh, event next Friday. This is going to be the webinar number 30 among the series of webinars organized by the Egyptian Society of Neurosurgery and the Continental Association of African Neurosurgical Societies. This important event will be concerning how to promote neurosurgical research and neurosurgical publications. Editors-in-chief of the top journals of neurosurgery are gathering in this symposium. They are going to speak about uh, how to increase the quality of neurosurgical articles submitted to their neurosurgical journals, and hence how to increase the incidence of publication. We are going to have among our speakers, Professor Miguel Areis, going to speak about the role of the WFNS Foundation in promoting neurosurgical research, and Professor Nelson Asiko, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurosurgery, Professor Edward de Benzel, uh, editor in chief uh, of Journal of, uh, of uh, World Neurosurgery, Professor Marco Fontanello, editor in chief of the Journal of Neurosurgical Sciences, Professor Concisio 
di Ruku, editor in chief of the child nervous system, Professor Christopher Bono, editor in chief of the spine journal, and Professor Jeffrey Wang, editor in chief of the global spine journal. The flyer and program of this symposium is already available in the rotating banner of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. Thanks to all of you and hope to see you all again in another occasion soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a very nice weekend, you all. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Is Mazika Michel?